It is a beautiful morning in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A beautiful morning to watch some SPL action. You've got Frog, you've got Bobby, and you've got day two, week number six of SPL Road to Worlds. Fantastic day ahead of us. Are you feeling good, man? I'm feeling great. Feeling this is going to be good. It's kind of a spooky weekend as well. We got the got the you know got the pumpkins, got the got the decorations. We can take a look at our schedule as well to see what's going on this weekend. Yesterday we saw our matchups: Gilded Gladiators falling to the Leviathans, Ravens take down a 3-0 against the Hounds as well. And today we've we've got some big ones inbound: Camelot Kings versus the Sticks Ferrymen coming up in our match of the week to start the day. And then Oni Warriors going up against the the newly revitalized Jay Dragons as well to close us out. Should be a day full of great matches. And uh, the, the, the look at the standings, this one's pretty important for the Kings. They are sitting right there in the middle of the standings next to the Ravens. And if they want a chance at taking that second place spot in their division, they're going to have to put on a show in this matchup. Yeah, this is definitely one that they're going to want to take. To be able to pass up the Ravens, you need to win out. So at this point, you need this win, and you're playing against a fantastic ferryman team, so you're going to have to compete. You're going to have to play very, very well. Yeah, this is a, is a tough place to be in when you need a win, but also you're facing the Sticks ferryman because we've seen where they've been at all season long, essentially at the at the top. They take our, our Phase 1 playoffs, right, and they've been dominating this entire set. But, I mean, the Kings... They've had a lot to, to work on, I think. You, you watch some of their games going back and forth. They have been working on a couple of things. And, you know, naturally they, they go in with this new roster change at the start of our, our phase, the, the Quig pickup. And I think they've struggled to find their footing a little bit. But when they've looked good, they, they've looked good. I, I think struggling to find their footing is, is the big point. They've had some great games, some great sets where they look like a team that's meshing well together. And, and then they have their these sets where they just seem like they're – not really on the same page, and that comes with those roster changes. Not all roster changes are going to be flawless, and you're going to have an instant, you know, pickup. But this is like kind of a game to turn it around with. This is a game you want to win, a game you need to win. You've had now a pretty long time since you last played. You haven't played in a week, and the last set was against the Dragons. And you looked fine against the Dragons, but you definitely could have looked better. But now you've had a week off, a week to scrim. This is a game that you need to be, you know, prepared for, you need to be prepped for, and... It, it, it's it's a tough one to be put in because it is the ferryman, as you said. Well, we're also on that new patch as well, right? 10-10, you've gotten a couple of changes. Might change how they're uh, thinking about the meta. We'll find out directly from them how they're thinking about their game. So we've got an interview with Biggie. That's right, I've got Biggie standing by. And Biggie, uh, really up front, has just kind of been a mixed bag of success so far for the Kings this phase. Kind of wondering like how you and the team are, are feeling and, and what you're looking forward to or, or what kind of changes you're making. I think it's been a mix of not playing well as a team, but also individuals not playing at their best. And I think when you have a mix, it feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall. And then you're losing quite a bit, so you're confused with the meta. But our environment's good, you know. There's no no, no negativity where we have the our focus in the right place. It's just a matter of, like, if it clicks, when it clicks, you know. I know, you know, they had kind of mentioned it on the desk. It's been a while now that since you picked up Quig, and a lot of it, like, you know, this team's full of veterans, even including yourself. Like, you guys have all been around for a while. Quig, who has played in the SEC for a long time, finally making that jump to the SBL this year. Just how well has he kind of meshed in with the team now that you've had a lot of weeks' experience? He's been great. I think our underperformance has nothing to do with Quig. I think we'd probably, we'd most likely be in the same spot if we still had Sam. It's not really relevant. I think Quig's a great teammate, and he's been really good for us. He's a good leader as well on the map. No complaints that. Good pickup for you. And then the question I think that, that is on everybody's mind, right? Going up against the Ferryman, what are your thoughts on this matchup? I think they're the best team in the league right now. When they are in a good position with their drafts, they're very difficult to beat. And right now, I feel like they're almost impossible to beat in a draft. But it'll be a good gauge for us, I guess, going into the tournament in the next couple of weeks, exactly where we are, because they are the best team right now. So let's see what happens. I'm excited to watch. I'm sure everyone at home is as well. So thanks for your time. Good luck in your games, man. And we'll throw it to the desk and they can continue to break it down. Well, you hear it there. I mean, they're facing against the, the best team in the league, and it's it's a tough one at that. And they, their drafts, right, the Ferrymen have been solid in their drafts, but the Kings specifically, I think it's been an area where we've seen ups and downs from them 
and what they've prioritized and, and some of the success that they've had in those drafts as well. I think Biggie is correct to highlight the drafts. When you think about this Ferryman team, a lot of their losses you kind of attribute to them playing something that isn't really expected. The Ola Run Jungle. I mean, e even the E-set, which they played and it looked fine. It, it, those different characters, those different gods in the jungle, and it's mostly jungle if we can really be honest. It's Sino. With how he wants to pick, how he wants to play, this is just the type of player he is. So it's, it's that kind of coin flip of what does he want to play. But I, I think if you really look at both of these teams, I think with how the meta has developed, I think we have to look at the solo lane. The mage meta in solo lane, the switch from no warriors, no guardians. I, I think it starts and ends in this lane for this game. No, I mean, we, we saw it yesterday where in like the last match, we finally got warriors to play in, in that first 3-0 of the day. But even, I mean, we saw Changa, we, Morgan the Fae, Raijin, as well as, you know, some of these guardians that Variety has been playing. I mean, we see in the clip here, this, this Cerberus, the Jing Chen that we saw him play last week as well. It's been a question of, you know, how are, are you going to play into the meta? Some of these solo laners have found a lot of success with the mages. Some are not as willing to get in there and just follow along with the with the Raijin, with the mage meta. And I think we have a little bit of a, a, a dichotomous matchup here where Variety has been one a little bit more unwilling to go to those mages, whereas Baskin has jumped in headfirst. I think 100%. You think of those mage... The, those mages it started with like Baskin and Fine OK and then you think about the solo laners that haven't really transitioned fully to it Kana Variety still playing those warriors a lot of Ama, a little bit of Wukong and then even though mages are viewed as kind of the best class to play in that role Variety's still kind of shied away from them and he's picking towards those guardians as you highlighted Cerberus Xing Chen he's played a couple times they've looked good but now this is something where is it good enough that you can be beat the mage meta in solo lane against one of the best teams in the league or as biggie said the best team in the league it's a, it's a question i am curious about i mean certainly something that we haven't seen them completely you know go away from we just saw in the clip there right he has pulled out the raijin but i mean baskin one that has been a little bit more willing to get into this role and the ferryman as a whole have been able to I mean, you heard Biggie say it, they're almost impossible to draft against just because the amount of flex potential they can have. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, th we see the innovators, you know, they, they were the first ones, or I mean, they the, the ferrymen were not the first ones to pull out the Raijin solo, but we started thinking about other mages, you started thinking about how you can play this solo lane and, and around that jungle solo duo that the ferrymen have. These guys are innovators, they'll play whatever. Yeah, they'll 100% play whatever. They also will try top tier. Like, this Raijin wasn't just first picked in solo. It started in mid, and then it was so strong in mid that Baskin and, and Fine OK, I, those two kind of paired together as the mage innovators in solo lane. They started, you know, testing those really strong mid laners and play them into the I into the solo lane. I mean, this Raijin has looked fantastic. The Opwash has looked fantastic. And it's it doesn't even feel like the team around them took a step back because... It changes how the entire map plays when you have these mages in solo lane. No longer do you have that true frontliner that can get fights started. And if you have a jungler like Sino, who is willing to be the one to engage, to dive, these backliners like Apwash and Raijin just feel that much better. Yeah, and you see Baskin with a couple of highlights there. He spent a lot of time on this Raijin. You saw him on the, uh, on the Poseidon as well, but... I mean, these rotations, when you can get involved early in the fights, Baskin, one of the solo laners, has been more willing to rotate in some of these matchups. And he uh, he, he likes this uh, this monkey skin for, for the Raijin as well. I think he has a one like a, a higher win rate on this skin than the other Raijin skins he's played in the same period of time. So, interesting stat. But, either way, this is a team that definitely has the flex potential to be able to go back to a Raijin or even, I mean, they'll pick the Apwash and they won't even put it in solo. They'll, they'll put it in mid. They can, essentially, they'll pick the Surter and they'll put it in jungle instead, right? So, like, they have a ton of options for where they're going to find this frontline presence. Yeah, they have plenty of, uh, of as you, you said earlier, flex potential with their draft and how they want to play. And we've not seen them since last week. So now we've had that extra week of scrimming. We've seen some Chongas, like you said yesterday, some different mages. I wonder if Baskin's been trying even more, trying to find something that can beat this Opwash, can beat this Raijin, or if it's just 
they have kind of found the peak in that meta over there in solo lane, and it's just there needs to be more prio towards that Opwash and the Ryzen. I mean, we've seen these guys first picking this Ryzen, and first picking Opwash even once, and then they'll just flex it. And those flex potential gods have so much more power than the rest because you don't know if you have to prepare for a tank Opwash solo, or Paul somehow not dying or dying very rarely on this Opwash in mid, but it does a ton of damage and it has a ton of area control. And so now, curious how it lands with th this Ferryman team. Have they kind of found the top of the meta, what they want to play? Or is there something that they've found that can beat this Ryzen, can beat this Opwash? A and it's also the same for the other side. Have the Kings found something, or will they just start playing it also? Right, I mean, and even outside of the solo lane, <clears throat> the, the Ferryman, they played the Hell last week. They, they can pull out, I mean, so much of this pick and ban prowess, I think, centers around Paul as well. Just... People trying to ban him out and then being unsuccessful and banning him out inevitably. That's why, I mean, you can't ban Sino out either. It's really tough to ban Baskin out. We'll see how they adapt in game number one at the very least. Biggie talked about it. it's going to be difficult, but sure enough, the Camelot Kings have to have a plan going into this pick and ban phase. Styx Ferryman, they're in that first pick slot and off the bat will take away the soul, but. I mean, with the focus around that soul lane and around how heavily prioritized some of these mages are, Opwash and Raijin are really the ones I'm thinking about when I think about the Styx Ferryman and, and top pick potential. Let's see if those come through in the band. Thus far, though, I can just be happy that we've taken Chernobog off the board. Bog's gone. That's a highlight already. And then the Ferryman also looking for these mage ADCs, so kind of a lot of ban prio towards this ADC role. They want to ban away... Gods in that lane that can push down those Bastions, get that early gold, and then play around those shield camps. Ferrymen don't want to worry about that, banning those away, and, and Kings want to ban the rotation prowess of Chernobog. We could go on and on about how many strengths this god has. And Ama banned by the Kings also. We haven't seen a ton of prio on this Ama by the Ferrymen. A lot of times they look to ban it, or, or they just rely on the other team to ban it. And I, I would think Kings would be the one that would want to try to, you know, play towards this Ama a little bit. On the other side, they did. They just banned it away. And the Ferryman banning away the Opwash, which we've not seen the Kings play this Opwash yet. Yeah, that's a surprising one for me. Perhaps something that Variety's been pulling out in scrims or even Tings has gone back towards. But something the Ferryman obviously think is very strong. And I'm looking at Raijin, right? Still up on the board. We'll see if the Kings want to prioritize that as a ban. But also notably these powerful supports. Athena still on the table. Yamoja still on the table for that priority if that's something they want to go to. And Quig, he has a he's a solid Yamoja, so especially I think would be the Camelot Kings trying to, to force their way onto that pick if it does make it through. At this point, if, if I'm the Kings, I think I'm I'm almost not banning any of them and, and trying to leave those three picks open just so I can guaranteed get two of them. And they opt for the Ratatasker. So now we have, as you said, a lot of these Pryo support gods up. We've got that Ryzen up also. Ferryman should just lock in this Ryzen here. You can pick out then whatever is just left over after that. You've seen how much you're able to do with this Ryzen. And Baba, it, it's... They, they just switch up their draft, and I think it really is dependent on who they're playing. I, I think they might even be calling the buff of the... The buff... The bluff. The bluff of the kings that... Maybe you don't play this Ryzen. Kings answer and play the Ryzen to lock it in already. Yeah, I mean, Variety has played in this pick before. Not something they've gone to as much as other teams, but something in particular they've found a little bit of success with. I can't believe I forgot the Babiaga existed. Clearly, though, the Ferryman did not. They knew that that was a pick in their back pocket. And now the Kings, they get a strong top two as well. This Ryzen and the Athena for Quig. Some global pressure, some mage solo pressure. I mean, that's, that's a pretty powerful top two. Yeah, it's a great top two, and there is some flex potential still there. Would be surprised if it doesn't go to solo the Ryzen, Athena most likely to support, but there's always that flex potential. And now with that Athena locked in, you have to look towards the Yem. That's kind of that next support up, next strength in that role. But we've seen Aurora kind of play a lot of different gods. It doesn't have to be this Yem here. He'll, he'll play maybe Sobek even, even if it's not viewed as that top tier god because it fits maybe some of their comps that they're willing to play, especially with their those solo mages. Sobek gives you a lot more full frontline in your, your support role, and Yamoja doesn't really do that, but 
You leave open Erlang. It comes back to Sino. Sino's going to be locking in this Erlang. That gives them good CC, good front line. And then with that, they can pair it with the Emoja, which they are hovering. Lock in. Top two by the Kings, good. But that top three by the Ferryman is looking nasty. Yeah, it's tough not to go to the Emoja here if you're a Roar. Kind of half. Like, it's it's so high up on the tier list at this point that if you were to go to something else, it, it almost feels bad, even if you can play other gods. So at this point, have to make sure you take that before the second phase of bans come through. And you give sign of this Erlong Shen, a pick that he has looked solid on, get a little bit of auto-attack damage, that taunt to bring through more of the CC. But this is what I wanted to see from the Kings. Twig has been a focal point for this team. You have a great game on Twig, you might just win out. You have a bad game on Twig, it's really tough for the Kings to try and make up for that. And Hunbats has been his bread and butter god for a lot of his career. He's played this god a ton, and it just got buffs in 10.10. 10. 10. And, and 10. it's 10.11, rather. Yeah, yeah, 10.11. And, and it's a god that he had this little resurgence with in this phase. He was picking maybe some other gods. The rat looked fine. The lance looked fine. And then he pulled out the Hunbots, and it looked fantastic. It helped the team mesh together. There was something they could play around. And now, as you said, with those buffs, there's even more of a reason to play this character. So now, top three by the Kings, Raijin, and Athena, Hunbots. Great team fight, great beads pull, and, and just strong laning phases already just from locking in that Raijin and Solo. And Athena is going to be strong over in support. Going to the bands, Herc banned by the Kings. Not something we've seen too much. Too much. It, it's a... Not really a meta for Herc, so a little different to see that band there. Maybe it's a it's something that feels good into that Ryzen. It's a little bit of sustain can interrupt him. Cuckoo banned by the Ferryman. Ishtar banned by the Kings. We've seen Sino, or, uh, Cyclone pull that out a good amount in this second half picks. And Rama is the last ban for the Ferryman. Some interesting ones here as to what the Ferryman are, are focusing on. I suppose we've seen Benenu on this Kukulkan in the, in the past. I think we've seen Tings play it at one point or another in his career as well. But an interesting one to, to focus out if that's a mid matchup that you're worried about, I suppose. But I mean, one thing that they don't ban out is this on her pick, something that is heavily prioritized. I automatically go to Vaporish Co. and start thinking about the dragons. But with how much success he's having on it, you got to imagine it's a pretty heavily prioritized pick. But it, you know, it's down here in the in the second half of the draft for the Kings. Yeah, and especially with all those ADCs banned in the first ban phase, you'd expect maybe ADCs would have to be locked in a little bit earlier, but the honor gets all the way through, locked in by the Kings. Going over to the Ferryman, you need an ADC here, and you need a solo laner. There is a few of those next level mages up for the Ferryman, Morgan, and as I'm speaking about it, Morgan gets locked in. For ADC side of things, you're finding... It really deep into the ADC god pool. There's a lot of gods banned. Neath hovered, Neath locked in. We've seen maybe one Neath this entire phase, but she's getting buffs, so many patches. She might be in a good spot where you can actually lock her in and she's gonna feel really, really good. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we haven't really seen from the Styx Ferryman. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw Cyclone Spin play this god, but Perhaps something, you know, bring a little bit of global pressure. You just have farm over there and on the left-hand side. On the other side, though, this is uh, this is an interesting one from Tings. Pulling out the Scylla. You pull it out against Paul. We saw Venenu on this pick yesterday find some success. And I, I'm, I'm looking at the King's draft, and you have a ton of setup for this Scylla damage. And with Scylla buffs also in 10-11, that root duration lasts a little bit longer now. So now it feels a little bit better to follow up off CC because it's not going to DR'd as much in the early portion of the game. And it looked good yesterday, as you highlighted. Venenu looks good on it. But against Paul, against this Ferryman's comp, this is a comp that wants to go into the late team. So this Scylla is almost guaranteed going into the late team. You also think about the Ferryman and how they play. They're not a team that will opt to only play through the early game. They will happily go late. And if you're going late against the Scylla, a 50-50 fight late game, you have really good secure. You have reset potential on the ultimate. And this team fight ultimate of the Kings, it, th this comp drafted by the Kings was fantastic. The combination that they have with, you know, you burn beads and then you immediately take advantage of it with Athena Taunt, with Hun Bat's ultimate. 
And on the other side, you have, you know, aggression and the, the back line sticking together. And then we haven't even talked about the Raijin ultimate that's going to be ripping through these team fights. You have so many tools in the tool belt if you're the Kings. I, I really like the Varyman draft too, though. You know, I mean, it's a hard top three to argue against. The, the Baba and the Emoja coming out, a comfort pick for, for Sino. I'm a little bit more worried about the last two. We, we've seen the MLF in solo, and this Neath is, is kind of a volatile pick, but. If it's something the ferrymen have practiced, I'm inclined to I'm inclined to let him cook, man. You know, I don't know. Yeah, the Neath, I especially want to highlight as a different pick. This is not something we expected to see. The the, the MLF I really like. It's a good solo lane matchup into Ryzen. It gives you kill potential over there. It gives you good beads pull in the early portion, and it's a winning one v one over there. But Neath, not a great team fighting god. She kind of wants to split the map. But this allows Sino to maybe play for that one v one. And then just have the Neath ult flying over to match that Athena ult. Because now you have the kind of mind game of, okay, well, if we split over here, we have a Neath ult. But they have Athena ult. So it's just going to be, how are they both opting to play? Because if they don't play split both teams, they're making their comps kind of slightly worse. Because you're not making use of the Athena ult. You're not making use of the Neath ult. But if you see both of these comps, how they're willing to play, how they want to play... Both comps are very, very good. It really comes down to who can pilot their comp better. And this is the most exciting type of game to watch where they both draft really well and it just comes down to the play. It's definitely going to be execution heavy. You heard Biggie on the interview. They're feeling confident. They just have to put it all together on the right day. And game number one, this is where the Kings have to put it together up against the Ferryman. We'll throw it to the casters, Gore and Trelly. Thanks so much, Frog and Inbound. That's right, it's going to be Gore and Trelly and, of course, Doug who's going to give us the views into the battlegrounds. Ferryman, Trelly, got a pretty mean top three. <laughs> when we're looking at that draft, the Baba, the Erlong, the Emoja. That being said, you know, the Raijin, the Athena, something that's treated the Kings incredibly well. 73% in favor of the Ferryman, which is a pretty hefty, hefty bet on their side. But that's where the chat's leaning. And the Neath, something that we haven't seen too often. I mean, it feels like we really have uh, a few things to maybe pick at. But I do want to ask, because Quig specifically has had some real mean Athena games, is do you think he has enough follow-up? I mean, silly, you got Raijin, you got on her. Does he have enough behind him to make this look just as good as I've come to expect? I actually love this, because so much recently has been these Guardians invading buffs. You can see Quig was ready for it. Yeah. But the Styx Ferryman, they decide to take their gamble and say, you know, we don't know that Quig's going to be here just in case he shows up. Let's pull behind where we would usually go for, and Quig can't invade now. He doesn't get any XP there, and he's stuck at level 1 for a bit. But with that, you know, to your question, Athena is just in a great spot at the moment. Yeah. The global presence is going to be super annoying to try and deal with. That's usually how these things go. But... I do like the, the, the Neath in this setup just because of that global presence, right? It's not going to be the hard the hard carry late game. It's not going to bring good fire giant tread. But what it does do is says, hey, I, I've got CC across the map. I can help you with your ganks. I can help you, you know, if you're trying to find your 1v1s, your 2v1s. That's what Cyclone Spin's going to be playing for. Not fighting Yarkor. That is not where Neath's strength lies. He's going to be playing pretty far back over on that left lane. <laughs> But I, I'm paying attention to World Weaver cooldown, man. Any time that Sino wants to look for an opportunity to fight, you got to look towards Cyclone Spin. And I I do, like, want to really lean into that. Like, it's mostly the, hey, by the way, I'm a global presence as well. Not, by the way, like, Unravel just got buffed, so I'm healing myself a little <laughs> more. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's going to help, though? I, I, like, you know, you had mentioned specifically, like, the 1v1. I don't, I'm going to be real with you. I don't ever see a Neath taking the 1v1 on equal footing with an on her and feeling real good about it. But do you think like having that little bit of healing, oh my god, speaking of a little bit of healing, variety is in vast need of it right now. A lot of pressure coming out from the ferryman. Maybe we can ignore uh, the 1v1 for the carry since it won't happen for a while. But it is going to be interesting to see this dynamic. And really, it's this balance lately. But unfortunately for the Kings, the Ferrymen have found just perfectly, right? Morgan Le Fay over there for Baskin. It's been looking great. Twig on this Hunbats. Uh, a lot of this team for the Kings has been ride or die on if Twig and Variety can get you know, the, the ball rolling for them. We'll have to see if they're able to. First blue buff spawn is going to be telling, right? Look at Captain Twig, look at Variety's health bars. Very low. Sino, Baskin, 
essentially full. If I'm Sino, I'm making a beeline for Variety's blue buff, and I'm doing it very quickly. That's what he does. Passes Baskin's blue, says, hey, we are full HP. They don't know exactly how weak Captain Twig is, but they have to know this buff is spawning in, and it's going to be very difficult to try and fight for it. Unless a rotation from Tings comes in, yeah, they better go in here. And they've got the damage, and they've got a he little bit good dash from Variety, what? but like you said, he goes in, and that's going to be the damage. Sino takes him out, gets the blue buff, and it's first blood for the Ferryman. Gore, I don't know why he did that. I'm going to be real with you. I, He lost his beads, he didn't get the buff, and he gave up first blood. For a blue, you've got Vamp Shroud. You don't need the mana sustain. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that serious. I'll be real with you. I was trying to find a silver lining while you were There's highlighting. None. There, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he got the tier two first over Baskin. That's oh, he, quick back. That's true. Quick back. Quick back. Got back, back to base. <laughs> That's big. If he uses it, hey, if, if if Variety solos Baskin right now, it was all worth it. But Baskin has all Variety doesn't, so I'm thinking not going to be the best selection there. And this is a conversation we talk about a lot when Ryzen is in play. Some people just can't not dash in. And it's, it's yeah. very enticing. It's CC. It's damage. Maybe the call was, hey, we can fight here. Of course, they couldn't because Twig shows up with zero HP. He's like, bro, we're going to 50-50 your buff, and I'm going to leave. I, I don't know who told you to dash in, but it wasn't me. And we'll see what Twig might be able to do as balance. Force the beads out of Paul. No, not the beads, just the ult out of Paul with the fear no evil. So a one-for-one one ult trade. No kills found, and that's the the big thing. And Trelly, man, we harp on this every time we see Hoonbats. Twig does it well, but I he's got to show up and he's got to try to burn more beads and he's got to be there on cooldown, right? Like that's kind of the big deal. The only downside is that because he didn't get the beads, Paul, that window is is, is just lesser, right? If you go for him now, he can still beads, and then after that, within you know 40 seconds, depending. He's going to have his ult back. Yeah, I and mean, so, it, it's nice to gank Paul, oof. but unfortunately, there was just no chance, right? As long as he's on point with popping that ultimate, it's never going to net much. Even if he gets the beads, he's going to be sitting just fine. Oh, Sino. man. <laughs> he's even giggling. He just takes it from him. Unfortunately, once again, Twig and Variety, they're not going to be able to get anything rolling on this <laughs> side of the map. If I'm Twig, I am ignoring this side of the map. I'm saying, Variety, good luck, bro. Hopefully you can steal the next blue. We need to look towards Duel. And there's a Neath over there. No CC immunity. Backflip, extremely telegraphed. There's a much better chance at a gank. Man, Cyclone, ready to charge that ultimate onto Yarkor. Or it's like, maybe we can kill here. Not quite enough damage to go for it. But that World Weaver is available. Duel lane isn't back, though. That's a big difference maker. Cyclone wants to get the full Transcendence online. Still has so many potions as well. You can tell. That sustain has been doing him justice. He's got four potions still in pocket. Has not went back to base yet. Yeah, honestly. We talk a lot. It's real easy. In Smite, the lane phase tends to end a lot quicker, right? And it's pretty easy to be like, okay, well, you know what? Let's talk about Team Fighter. At least, like, small groupings from the Hunters. In the lane phase-wise, this has been great for Cyclone just in terms of, like you had highlighted, sustain. Being able to keep up. Almost in a position. Maybe if On Her was a little closer, if Harcourt was a, a little further down in lane, there would have been an opportunity for the World Weaver and some aggression. And the unfortunate note, which I guess is, is looking at the aggression, because you had mentioned the other side of that, right? Having Twig and the rest show up to bully out anybody they can and left. Every single member of the Ferryman have beads. Every single one of them are prepared for that. Including a roar, uh, but double down for Cyclone. So even if Twig makes it over there, it's definitely going to be a complicated task to try and chase him down. The good news is you've got a lot of CC over there, right? Like you've got the the taunt, you've got Fear No Evil if he shows up, you've got Hardcore Stun. Do you see? I guess maybe that not just being a necessity, but easy to pull beads and easy to follow up afterward, or do you think that it's I don't want to call it a lost cause, but do you think it's something that's just going to be too complicated and you'd rather just farm? It, it's just no one else is pulling beads, right? If you, you can see Aurora has been taunted three or four times since we panned over to him and his health bar hasn't changed, right? Aurora is just extremely tanky at the moment. Whereas, you know, Quig and Yarkor don't have that much kill potential until level 9 rolls around. It gets a little bit better. Desert, Desert Fury, the, at level 5, got kill potential, but at level 9, when you put your second point into your ult, 
you get hunter to zero a squishy character if you hit all eight of those spears so maybe there's some threat on beads once yark takes over level nine but if i'm cycling an aurora i'm not beadsing anything unless captain twig is the one dishing out that cc there's just no kill potential at the moment i want to see these world weavers man cyclones went around the corner and charged a few up i'm, I'm assuming he was looking towards variety once he looked over towards yark core didn't end up sending it out but at this point you got to think you know, ulting off cooldown isn't going to be the the biggest deal, right? Yeah. Y you want to save it to, to confirm a kill, sure, but it's been eight minutes. He's probably had his ult for a solid five of those minutes. Could have sent it out three different times at this point just to get chip damage or try to open up some relics. Hasn't sent it out yet. Just wants to hold on to that cooldown. Does end up beadsing. That was a little bit of aggression there. Yarkor did ult as well. You can see that cooldown's down. So the level eight ult was enough to threaten the beads from Cyclone Spin. Stole full HP. But now Captain Twig's got a target. It does open up opportunities for the Kings. It's also interesting, the last few times, actually it's the Kings. Tings is who I think of when I think of Neath. Because Tings has played it in mid most recently compared to, to pretty much anybody else who's picking Neath. And a lot of that conversation has been because World Weaver has less time to travel, you're in mid lane so you can throw it towards left or right, and you're going to be feeling the impact for it. For Cyclone... If they want to shoot at Variety, which so far has been a pretty good option, it feels like, you're going to be waiting a little while if you're basking for that World Weaver to connect. And there's four random targets on the map that could block it on just accident. Just like accident? Yeah, like on, on accident. <laughs> you're just you're just farming mid camps. You're like, dude, I just got ulted. I didn't even see the target around me. And Variety's just like, my bad, bro. Like, I'm just <laughs> on the other side of the map lining that one up for you. But I think Cyclone wants a little bit more damage. He's got the party punch as well, so it will pack. No pun intended. A little bit extra of a punch there with the ultimate. Probably just going to go full red items, I would assume. Which means, again, I already touched on this. The fire shred. Gold fury shred. Not going to be as prominent. Your burst is okay. Then you look over at Big Man Tink and you're like, huh, are we out bursting? I'm a monster. Not if he's on point. But then you have to talk about, you know, Fear No Evil is still a great steel tool as well. Six Ferrymen have that commanding presence to be able to just go for a pull whenever they want doesn't mean it's going to be free. And actually, Sino, you know, known for his tankier style jungle builds, Atalantis right into the Shoguns, fearing some of that magical damage coming from Variety, coming from Tings, and I suppose coming from Quig as well. He's going to be hard to kill, but also doesn't do too much damage. And it really gets us into to this portion of it. The game, outside of Baskin, who's relatively consistently been bullying Variety, they haven't been super aggressive. So, Gore, in, in ranked at the moment, it's very popular to do Baskin's build. Uh, his consumables, I should say. Where you go Chalice into Ward Chalice, you get free wards. I, I saw Quig picked it up. That's normal. That's a support. Yarkor picks up the Ward Chalice, puts his build back a solid 400 gold. But he's going to have a lot of vision. He, it's going to be very difficult to gank over there. You can tell Sino doesn't even want to spend too much time on this side of the map because Yark knows exactly where he is at any given moment. Sure, like I said, you're not going to be finishing that executioner, but a blink in from Quig. He's trying to get aggressive. Yeah, looks for the taunt onto Sino, who instead finds a taunt onto Tings, forces out the dash, and keeps Tings on his toes, forces the Scylla to fall back. Rest of the Kings, it seems like, kind of scattering around. Fight over the shield buff. It's going to be successful oh for the Kings. Goodness. Oh my god, the damage on the hardcore. You just need a little bit more, and that's going to be the fire bolts from Paul locking it down. And they aren't done yet. Sino wants a little more. Again, taunt already used. So he'd have to hide a really good pin and have some good follow up. Looks like he pulled Cyclone it falling back. Free. He's going to be just fine. And there's no, no response, Shelly. Nothing from the Kings. No, I saw Twig. He looked over. He said, can I help here? No, there's absolutely nothing I can get done. Unfortunately, Sino pulled the buff right into Quig's three, so that confirms the buff invade. Not going to be going the way of Yark. Or not going to be going the way of Cyclone, I should say, because Yark's going to be able to pick it up. I thought maybe we'd see a Gold Fury pull there. There was still some great aggression. Paul is showing just how much burst damage this Baba Yaga can do. Level 13. Did end up using beads, so I suppose you could say there's a target, but again... It's just not easy to try and, you know, blow through Paul's HP unless Big Man Tings is getting involved. And there's a three-level deficit there. Captain Twig would rather farm than try and group up. Of course, he's only one level behind Sino, but, you know, Tings has so much more farm to himself. Maybe playing through Scylla is the only call the Camelot Kings have for now. 
It's not like the solo laners have been rotating out. I mean, level 12 came around, and that's when you get your second relic. It's not going to be Teleport. <laughs> More often than not, it's almost always Beads Aegis or Blink for Baskin. That Blink Dragon flight could be some of the best initiation you could ask for, honestly. It's almost unbeadsable if you're if you're too quickly. If Baskin just immediately pops it, so could be some good engage. Just waiting to see. Either way, if Big Man Tinks is not there, I don't think the Camelot King should be fighting. Teams, man, I'm I love it when Scylla, when burst mages. It just feels like when they're able to to kind of weave their way into the meta. It's just fun. It makes it's objectives just fun. real yep. fun. And that's the problem is it's real fun to watch because they have big numbers. We'll see some of those. Just a little bit of damage thrown out towards a roar, but I'm expecting a lot out of the Scylla. Especially to try and balance things out. So far, I mean, kills. 2-0, to zero, it's, it's not really that insane. Honestly, gold-wise, it's not even that insane. Only a 1,000 favor the Ferryman. They're going to try to change that. They pulled the Pyromancer. Paul's taking a lot of poke in mid, though, so that gives an opening for the Kings to try and get aggressive. They don't have a lot of damage. The Pyromancer is low, but it is not gone, and this is what you were saying earlier. Luckily for the Ferryman, they are able to secure that. But it might cost them a lot. No great beads from Sino, and a good juke gets him away from the I'm a Monster. And he gets to walk away with that one. So a Pyromancer and no kills dropped. The Ferryman pull a little bit of a gold lead. That did seem like a fight the Camelot Kings would be able to take. I mean, Captain Twig was sitting at the beacon just waiting, trying to go in. Did not end up finding an ability. And it looks like Variety will be getting chased uh -oh. down here. Does have the beats, uses it the slow. Not good oh enough. Sino confirms that kill. And the Camelot Kings knew there were two over. They, they grouped up towards gold. But they didn't feel confident going in for it. So that's going to be... A dropped opportunity, or maybe just not even one being given because the six Ferryman positions so well. Variety goes down to 0-2, loses his beads. Might even lose his tower if Sino and Baskin decide to group up here. Unfortunate. Big swings in their favor. Yeah, Sino's got the Runic Bomb, so could definitely get the tower if he needed to drop it, but will not need to. There's no one else here. Even more gold going in the Ferryman's pocket. Honestly. They had a little bit of leeway, and granted, we can see everything, right? We see a bunch of people back in base. Variety just now respawning, though. Maybe they could have put some pressure on the Tier 2, like you said, with the Runic Bomb. Safer call. They pull back. First tower, 14 and a half minutes in. And it's even more gold in the pocket for the Ferryman. It's going to be a taunt from Quig onto a roar. Not going to find too much in duo. And Trelly, I'm going to be honest, I expected there to be some more pressure over in duo. Throughout a majority of the game, World Weaver being charged. Not sure what Cyclone might be going for here. But it is a four man grouping from the Kings around the Fury. They're going to scatter to the winds. Cyclone's not going to have to use his ult. The downside of what we're seeing from Cyclone, though, while it's been a safe lane, he's got an assist, you know, no big World Weavers so far. You had kind of mentioned it, but getting into the team fight area, it's definitely a different dynamic from the Neath versus the Onher that the, the Kings are going to have. Yeah, you're going to lose a little bit of the presence of World Weaver. Yarkor is going to get a lot better in that team fight as opposed to over laning phase. Not going to be the biggest deal as long as the, the, the Ferrymen stick with their composition of we're hitting CC and then big burst damage after. They essentially just have two hard-hitting burst mages, right? But one's physical, one's magical. They've got Paul, they've got Cyclone. Sino's going to take care of a good portion of the Shred. He's got his kin size already online. Like I said, the Fire Giant is just going to be the real issue there. You're not going to be burning through that too quickly. As long as you're ahead, though, not going to be the biggest deal in the world. Cyclone, though, beautiful ward coverage. Knew exactly where Quig was there. Blink taunt off the mark just because he backflipped it immediately. He knew exactly when that Athena was going to be coming through. And to your point, duo pressure. It's not like the Kings haven't been trying. Yeah. It's just they can't find anything. Cyclone is playing as safe as possible. Yark has been stepping forward, trying to find some relics. There was one time Cyclone beads. That was it. Since then, has been sitting alone on an island. Aurora stops by every once in a while just to help him clear, but has not needed any of that help. At least Big Man Tings is still top farm in the game, sitting at level 17 yeah. XP-wise. <laughs> you you, you want to get that fast track to level 20, right? He's going to take a lot of CC here, probably ults the stun. That's going to be it. Yeah, beautiful ult. Variety times it well. No more fear of a gank. Beads goes down. Point being, Scylla, the more points you put into her abilities, the stronger she becomes. Getting level 20 is a massive power spike for Big Man Tings. 
It is going to be. At the rate he's been farming in the next few minutes, we'll see though if they make it there. Twig, level he's 14, silenced. just deleted in the mid lane. Quig has to try and retreat, does use the ult, and that's going to give the distance. But man, oh man, nothing Twig could do about it. No ult, no relics, no life for him. Four to zero for the ferryman. They're going to start up the Fury. It looks like Camelot King's going to read the map, start up the Pyro. Being said, they're spotted. Baskin, Sino. Going to keep their eyes on this. Gold Fury goes to the Ferryman. Now we'll see how the 2v4 goes out. You've got Scylla. What? And the Ferryman. Get it? Oh, my God. What? Yes, they do it. Not only do they do it with something simple. Oh, man. They're just able to pull it their way. That has to hurt when you use the I'm a Monster. What even? St uh, Tings had ult. He used Crush. He used them both at the same time. That is ridiculous. I thought I thought that said Sticks Ferryman got the gold. And I'm like, that makes sense. No, they got both. Sino has the Runic Bomb still. That is ridiculous. That hurts a lot. I mean, that, that was the only play the Camelot Kings have. Let's, re let's rewind time a bit. Captain Twig tries to get aggressive towards the beacon. He's got beats, he's got blink, he had ult. But Paul rolled the silence on his first ability, and Twig spamming jump. Why can't I jump over the wall? Why can't I jump over the wall? The random silence still left on the floor. Sure, he could have beats it, but what silence are you expecting from the Sticks Ferryman? You know, you, you just think you're going to be able to jump out there. Yeah. Unlucky roll or very lucky. Consider what you'd like. He goes down. Easy Gold Fury attempt. Hey, let's just go for our secondary prize of the Pyromancer. Can't even grab that. Well, they're going for Baskin right now, but this isn't working out for him. Oh, no, Sino. He does it again. Takes care of Twig. And Variety does not have a lot of room to work with. Beads from Sino. Shot from Baskin. Oh man, oh man, Twig, Variety taken down in the Ferryman. Whether you want to look at the 50-50s, the coin flips, everything is coming up their way. Yep, Cyclone Spin was the only one who wasn't involved in that fight, and he did send an ult over. One more Runic Bomb guarantees the Tier 2 tower in 19 minutes. It's almost time. I mean, the Ferryman, I think Cyclone clears one or two more waves, then heads over towards that Fire Giant. Seems like a free enough play to me. Aurora has to juke the Sikkim here. Maybe he doesn't even have to because yeah, I'm a monster <laughs> off the mark. He gets to walk out for free. I mean, less than free. You get I'm a monster for. That's going to be a big loss. Now Fire Giant looks even better. Right? That was the best steel tool available, and it's down for quite some time. But the Six Ferryman aren't rotating out yet. Paul is going for this Tier 1 tower. He wants a little bit more gold in his pocket. He'll grab it. And Cyclone's still over on the left side of the map. So no rush from the Ferryman to try and go for the pull here. But their gold lane is already pretty massive considering yeah. the Fire Giant hasn't even been looked at yet. I'm glad you mentioned it. Almost 7,000, 6,000 experience. Sino might be in a little bit of trouble. Might have some help though. Good shot. Is at least able to get enough, but that's a kill. Oh, he's clutch. For the Kings, basking over the wall, finds Twig in response, but they need a little more to make that worthwhile with how ahead you had for Sino. Rizard Butte was great. Lockdown Quig, but a blink. And a quick one at that gets the Athena away and a full-on disengage. Now it's going to be up to the Ferryman Trelli. They're pressuring out the Tier 2. And they've got the damage to knock it down. They will definitely grab that Tier 2. Time to back up. Variety notably stayed over on the right side of the map. He's stealing away some farm. The only thing he can do is Ryzen. Ability-wise, it's just a little bit behind Baskin. Wants to hit that level 20, wants to be able to be a big threat. Sticking around for the speed. I was going to say, that might be questionable. He does end up giving up on it. But the Camelot Kings going in for a Fire Giant pull. The Ferrymen are nearby. They might not know this is happening just yet, but Baskin's going to get a pretty good idea right when he walks up. Yeah, they're going to see it. The Rings of Fire show up. Fire Giant itself just above Tings has ult. Now at 50%. Now it's going to be going. Tings, like you said, has ult back up, but that's not the goal for the Ferryman. They're going to go in. They're just going to kill off one, kill Girl. off two. It's Twig. It's hardcore. And they are gone in the blink of an eye. Variety half health already. And the chase is on. Paul, Sino, Cyclone. They're just looking for the CC. They've got the slow. They've got the damage. And they've got exactly what they need. Killing spree for Paul at 3-0-1. Oh, and, and of course... That has not slowed the chase down anywhere. Shelly, 4-0 and 4, score not found. Basket still playing aggressive over on right. Zones out Ting, zones out Quig. And in the meantime, I missed it. Fire Giant does go to the Kings, but at what cost? Almost everybody on their team. And of course, the mid Phoenix now knocked down by the Ferryman, one of the most successful Fire Giant losses we've seen.
Yep, I mean, you hold on to it on Tings and Quig, but that's about it. The Styx Ferrymen are not afraid to fight into Fire Giant, and they're not afraid to step forward. I mean, it was a great call. Cyclone Spin ults Captain Twig. Immediately, they say, we're, we're killing the Sunbats before the fight even begins. Big Man Tings forced into the I'm a Monster well before Fire Giant gets low enough to ult it, so he just has to go for damage. Luckily, Yarkor confirms the Fire Giant with an auto attack, but as you said, they don't even make it out, right? Variety loses his relics, ends up going down. You just get Tings and Quig to make it out with their Fire Giant buff. Could be a steal attempt here. The six Ferryman still get the Oni Fury. And do, do the Camelot Kings even push up with this buff is my question. And I think probably not. Fire Giant only on two. Titans are going to be running up the left lane. I think the six Ferryman are just going to group up with their Titan and start pushing. I can't imagine they're afraid. Yeah, I can't imagine it either. They've only lost the one tower. Uh, meanwhile, every single tower stripped away from the Kings. Mid Phoenix gone. Left side of the map. Uh, at this point, about five seconds, if even. Titans are going to start marching their way down. Runic bomb in pocket for Sino. So, Trelly, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that maybe the opposite. I think the Ferryman will get aggressive. Oh, yeah. Not play defensive in any form or fashion. Maybe they'll rethink diving a Phoenix deep, but we, we got to talk about it, right? 9,000 gold in their favor, maybe a little under. But you've got level 20s, you've got massive leads, now, all of your relics are fine. Like It just feels like there's nothing playing against them right now. No, the, the six Ferryman can do no wrong as long as they're not over committing or taking, you know, choppy fights in a unweighted manner, you know. It's a 5v5 over on left with the Titan, they're going to feel good. They've got Oni minions over on right that it looks like the Camelot Kings are going to have to deal with. And still, fire minions pushing up middle. That's an important distinction as well. At least it's very close to the left side yeah. bird. But who's going to be shredding through this Titan is the question. Yarkor is the best option. Quig still has Blink Taunt. That could initiate this fight. Get some beads, then Captain Twig is able to blink to the back line. But look at this. Sino's already wrapping around. He's got a wave on him, but... They're just waiting for Titan here. It's going to be pretty hard to even stand in this Phoenix once Paul pops that ultimate and Sino goes around. And they're going to have a lot to work with. Variety already low. Quig as well, taking a lot of poke. They're going to go for their ults, try to create some space. Fear No Evil dropped to the back, but it's not going to be able to find too much. Sino goes in too deep, though. And that is finally a second kill for the Kings and a good defense. But it only Into goes so far. Oh, my God, Cyclone with a great weave. He only locks down two. Quig goes in, maybe too deep. A couple more autos, and the shot's going to be there. Cyclone spin with the kill, the Phoenix, and almost everything you would want for the Ferryman, save for a death on Sino. Yeah, I mean, Sino goes a little bit too deep there. Gets hit by the I'm a monster from Tinks, who has plenty of damage online. That level 20 power spike was hit. Probably hasn't been hit by the old all game, so didn't expect it to do that much. But are the ferrymen done? Doesn't seem like it. Heading over, going to take a red buff away. There's one more Phoenix left on the map. But Quig's going to be up in 15 seconds. There's no way they push forward. Not with that play happening. Cyclone's going to charge up just in case someone walks around the corner. But I'm thinking this is going to be a fire giant setup for the Styx ferrymen. Not a bad siege. Aurora almost level 20. The farm is just ridiculous. The amount of gold the Styx ferrymen have been able to accumulate in 26 minutes of play is absurd. Quig just upgraded his starter item last level, and Aurora's like, can't wait to sell my sturdy stew and get a, a, <laughs> my last item online. Aurora might hit 20 before Twig. I'm watching that very carefully, because that, I, honestly, it's one thing, you know, two, three levels up over Quig, but to be the same level as the opposing jungler when you're the support, that's a huge deal for Aurora. So I'm just keeping my eyes on their level counters for now. Twig, going to be farming as much as he can. Uh, Trelly does seem, uh, like you had said, not only is it set up for the ferryman on the fire giant, but also probably a real, not even reluctant, just a straight up, you know what, we can't fight it from the kings. They are all on the left-hand side of the map. Unlucky. Twig just ticked over. Was closer XP-wise, but Aurora's been around fire giant for a while. The Camelot kings are going to go ahead and take care of the Primal Fury. That one's going to be free. Another Runic Bomb. Not a bad look for the Ferryman. Remember that mid Phoenix did respawn, so being able to get that easily is going to help out. All five Camelot Kings heading back to base, though. Definitely the correct call. Got to be ready for a defense. We have seen, though, 
Overcommitments can be punished. Big Man Tings is a monster at times. <laughs> yeah. know, if he is able to hit that ultimate onto someone diving a little bit too far, Sino doesn't have the <laughs> Aegis. He has propensity to be a monster. He does. And if that is the case, you got to watch these overcommitments. Sino does not want to give a reset. You know, you get hit by one of those. Paul is in the middle of his house. He can't pop his Aegis either. That could be bad. So the Camelot Kings still do have ways back into this game. It's going to be a lot on Quig going in first. Looking for a taunt. Waiting for Twig. Same play as last time. See if they can run it back. Stick Sherman and walk up the mid. There are still fire minions on the left. They don't have to go in yet, but you can tell Cyclone's just waiting to half health someone before the fight even begins. The Phoenix, speaking of half health, is at half. Weakened from earlier. So the Kings in a good spot. Blink forward from Quig. Pulls out beads on Paul. Maybe that's the opening they need, but it's Harcourt who gets taken down to half. Variety. He goes for a little bit of damage with the Tycho drums. Only going to find a little bit Variety. of damage. A lot thrown back his way. Good dash over the wall. Gets him out of there, but opens up the mid Phoenix. Wide open for the Ferryman. Speaking of which, same thing. Twig drops down a Fear No Evil. Not a lick of follow-up. And that is going to make it have help for the right side. Phoenix Ferryman getting aggressive. Twig goes in, looks for a taunt. River's Rebuke gets dropped, separates the Kings as best they can. Ferrymen are going to isolate one, cut him down, and that's Quig who's gone. Now, it's next on the chopping block. Maybe nobody. The Kings playing in the Titan Room. Ferryman going to keep themselves just far enough away. But, Charlie, they got fire minions. They've got a lot of room to work with. They definitely do. This left side bird should drop down pretty much immediately. Captain Twig had a nice ultimate. Big Bang Ting's right there with I'm a Monster. Decides against it. The rest of the team, I guess, back in base didn't feel like they had enough damage to go for it. And now Titan's going to be the target here. The old oh, Honda man. Twig, he almost dies on impact. Luckily, makes it into the fountain, so he stays alive there. Tycho drums on the Paul. It seems like that's the goal. That's the target. Hardcore leaps in once the damage, but you just can't lock him down. Healing keeps Paul going. Half health variety. Barely makes it back to the fountain. Same thing for Twig. Unfortunately for them, while their health is good, the Titan falls anyway. And the Ferrymen take a commanding lead in game one. I mean, just surgical, right? Left side bird, go back, grab the mid Phoenix, redo it, go one more time, get all three, and then start looking towards the Titan. Never an overcommitment, never a misstep. There was maybe once where Sino overcommitted on that left side Phoenix, but, I mean, 12-2, to two, you can't really complain if yeah. you're the Sticks Ferryman. That was a clinical game number one. Definitely crushing the hopes of the, of the Kings a bit, but something to consider. They got Baba Yaga, Yamoja, and Erlong top three. Pretty close to a dream draft for the Ferryman. Let's hope they can't get that again. Yeah, that was a lot of the conversation the Kings had coming into this, was, was that discussion around the drafts, wh where they are, whether they get what they need, and I think in this case as well, if you strip away the things that are real good yep. for the Ferryman, maybe some things that change there. Uh, some things that, unfortunately for them, just do not go their way in that game. 50-50s that just fall apart, that crumble in their face. And like you said, 12-2, massive gold lead, and a game one victory here for the Ferryman. We'll see how it continues, what the Kings have to offer us for the rest of the set right after this quick break.
If you are not hyped for Worlds, you're just not paying attention because this is some of the best smite that, that we've been seeing. An uncontested top three teams. Everybody's battling for, for that top spot. We have so many storylines going into Worlds. And just, I mean, j said 77 days yesterday, if I've done my math correctly. Tough. I think it's 76 days. I think you're good. Okay, I so think you're good. 76 days away. From the world championship, and it'll uh, it, it's it's just around the corner. It'll be here before you know it, and uh, it's the dude. The energy is just electric, bro. I got goosebumps just from hearing Dave say, "Bow down to your kings," like, bro. That just that gets the casts for world's finals are so sick, and the, the the games are great. Untouched, unscathed. Bow down to your Camelot kings. Unfortunately, the Camelot kings they are indeed scathed. They're in, bowing in in this game number one. They are not untouched. Uh, you've still got Frog and Inbound on the desk. And after that game one, the Camelot Kings, they are uh, they, they they were struggling in that game number one. Yes, yeah, struggling is, is a light way to put it. I think starting in that first five minutes was Variety dashing on the blue buff and then dying not too long after, Charlie pointed it out. And that kind of explains kind of like the rest of the game. And it happens on both the side lanes. A lot of deaths happened. The Ferrymen were able to play on both side lanes very, very well. They put behind Variety. Uh, Variety still was farming up pretty well, but the amount of map pressure that the Ferrymen had, the jungle presence that Sino actually had in this game also, it was a... It, it wasn't too close of a game. Yeah, I, I still can't get over the stat. Paul is deathless no, still. Yeah. 
crazy on this pick. It, crazy. We are in week six, almost done with the Road to Worlds phase. And Paul is, it's not like he hasn't played it. He plays it almost every time it's available. And he, it just, they just can't kill him on it. And it's not like teams haven't tried. He's played the Warriors. He's played all of the top teams at this point. They're going, they're going back to back. They're playing other teams, right? This is the second time I think they've played. Oh no, this is a cross divisional matchup. Either way, though, if you're watching everybody else fail to kill him on Baba, why do you let him have? Why, why do you let him have the Baba? Yeah, I think we should never. At least this, the rest of this phase, we should never see another Paul Baba game. And, and I would almost extend that past Paul as Baba is like right there with Chernobog with the amount of strength that she has, where. Unless she's getting nerfed, you just don't want to play against her. Just get rid of her. She's just so strong. I mean, 18,000 damage. He doesn't do a ton of damage, but that's not the entire point of this Baba. It's the area control, the survivability, the range with her damage. She doesn't have to walk up so far, and if she does, she's still super safe. Yeah, that composition from the Ferryman is... I mean, it's hard to deal with for a ton of reasons. You get 8,000 healing from a roar. The Cyclone's beneath something that we maybe didn't have a ton of confidence in, but he really didn't need to be a carry <laughs> yeah. on it. Like he, the rest of his team did the rest of their team things. Like Sino played and did their long things. Their top three was just so strong. And, and like, how, how do the Kings adapt to that? Like you take it with Baba maybe, but it just felt like they didn't have the room. I, I like the draft they put together. I like the ideas that they had. But I mean, to pick some ads, they, they got to look for something different here for game number two, it feels like. Yeah, I think Maybe even taking the first pick side would have been the better play. They're giving the Ferryman the first pick side so that the Ferryman still will be able to pick the most valuable god up available if it's that Baba, uh, Baba, Chernobog, Yamoja, Athena, whatever god comes out. P's and B's so far the exact same. And we're, we're actually speeding through these on, the, on this first one. We have one ban left available on the Kings. And does it just have to be that Baba here? I I don't think it, I, I'm still surprised you were banning the Amaterasu personally. Exactly. Right with all the Same. mage solos that you're seeing. I get the Chernobog. That's that one that Cyclone might be the best Chernobog in the league at this point. But the Amaterasu is something they're they're still a little bit worried about. So they take that away. Last time in this slot, the Kings took away the Ranatonsker from Sino on the other side, which is not kind of kind of felt like a throwaway ban. Not something that the Sticks Raymond have gone back to. And this time. They, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't know what else to, I could have told you that was going to happen if you banned anything other than the Baba. I could have told you that the Ferrymen were going to first pick Baba. Maybe it's a Ryzen Yemoja here instead of the Ryzen Athena to provide more survivability for your own team and less survivability to the Baba. Because I think the Ryzen, if he doesn't dash in, I think Ryzen is a great pick here. And it's not the Yemoja, it's the Rat, which I guess it's fine because you're just going to pick the support that the ferrymen don't pick. But the ferrymen, Sino's going to find something to play no matter what. That, that's right. that's my opinion. He's going to play Rat. He's going to play Erlang. He's going to play something that can engage. But now if they go Yemoja here, something that Sino can engage with, even if it is that Hunbots, even if I don't think Hunbots is as great as his Erlang or his Rat, how are you going to still kill this Yemoja Baba backline? Yeah, it, it's it's... It's tough. It's something, I mean, you know, can't fault the Kings for having an idea. Twig has looked solid. On this Ratatosky, you get a little bit of global pressure, of course, and maybe they'll match it with the Athena. We'll see what comes through in this third pick slot. One thing clear, though, the Sticks Ferryman, they want to make sure this Neath doesn't get banned away from them. <laughs> they, <laughs> they reveal it in game number one. They're like, we can't let it go to second phase. It'll get banned away. We have to take it here. I, maybe they just see something with this Neath that we are maybe overlooking the... It, it very well might just be it is something that gives them a partial global to match this Athena. Maybe that is what it is. Kings opt for that Athena. They want that global presence. The Kings still have a really good top three. They had a really good top three last game. We talked about this on the last desk. It wasn't the P's and B's that really felt like a problem with the Kings. It was how they executed in game. A lot of just misplays and the ferryman rare to make misplays so you have to be able to play as well as them or exploit the few ones they make so i still don't mind their top three here that was kind of my entire point with saying all that it just kind of comes down to how they play with these top three yeah i mean bmt goes 2-0 last game he had the Scylla. i don't think he played poorly on the Scylla. they just weren't able to get him to that late game Scylla state weren't able to make that space for him and this one they'll keep on holding 
for that mid pick. Assuming, I mean, Oler has some flex potential, could of course still go to that mid lane. But you gotta imagine if Neath is, if they're getting away with Neath, no CC immunity, a jump away. I, I, I surely I can get away with Uller. We saw it yesterday too. Yeah, and, and with Uller's change, it, it makes him feel a lot more smooth. You don't have to spam as many abilities to get the value from the power of his kit. So I like this Uller. It's also some flex potential as you as you highlighted. So I, I like that it leaves it open. The Ferryman opt for the Nemesis Hercules. A lot of mages banned, so they opt for that Hercules, a matchup into this Ryzen, and then Sino on Nem. So now instead of having the engage in jungle, they shift it to solo lane, and their comp kind of just fills out and, and is going to be playing out almost the same with just slightly less poke, but it's just more viable engage. And the Kings with the last pick, Freya. Should mean Uller mid. There is some world where maybe Uller solo, Ryzen mid. We've seen Uller solos before. Obviously, we haven't seen Uller in a long time. But again, Kings have an, another good comp. My worry is this Baba Yamoja top two from the Ferryman is so lethal. Yeah, it, it, the Ferryman have proven time and time again that they just feel too strong on this combination to... Like it, it, they almost don't care what the Kings pick. They, they will just be happy with that top two pretty much no matter what. But, you know, we, we have yet to see. This will be a new matchup into the Baba. If it's Uller mid and and it does end up being into the Baba Yaga, something that can cancel the dash, something that also gets punished very heavily by the Baba silence if you do get that first ability. So a couple interesting interactions there. Be a new mid matchup for Paul to face into. But... I mean, this is a, a resurgence of the Freya. I'm looking at that for the Kings. It's also the Nemesis is big for the Ferryman because, uh, you know, the Kings only have that one true frontliner. You dash in on Athena, there's a little bit of a worry that you just get shredded down. I, I think that's actually a really good point to highlight. Tw Quig is going to have to play this game differently and, and respect almost what the, the Ferryman are going to be able to do if he does dash in. Last game, Erlang. Not a frontline killer, really. He's mostly just trying to get, you know, beads and then set up for his team. Right. And then you look at Nem. She will shred frontline. She will absolutely just... She doesn't even have to put abilities onto them other than her ultimate. And she will provide enough damage and enough shred for her team to kill. So it makes it so Quig's going to have to play a little bit differently. And then... I don't know. I am still just... Baba and Yem is such a strong point of contention in this. You dash taunt. We saw it a couple times. Paul doesn't even have to play back. He just ults the dash taunt. He's now immune, and now he's able to return a bunch of damage onto you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to get off this core just because of how well the ferrymen have played off of it. I think if you're you're Twig, you're the, you're the Kings, you just have to play outside of that. You have to play away from Paul. And maybe this Neath is, is the target that you're going for. You got a little bit of global pressure. You try and take the game to the Neath. I mean, do you expect him to see him over there in that dual lane? I, I expect side lane play by... Uh, by Twig, and I also think with this one and a half globals, you have the Athena ult, you have the Rat ult, this Neath is completely exploitable, same with solo lane, so just play towards those lane, forget about the Baba, pretend like she's not even there, Paul still hasn't died, just don't try to kill him, kill the side lanes. The Kings trying to play through the side lanes in this game number two, and they've got to make it look good if they want to even out the set. We'll throw it over to the casters. Thank you so much, Frog, and inbound as we jump into game two here. Ferryman, Trelly with the lead 1-0. Of course, Doug giving us the view into the game. And me and you were talking about it, but something about Baba Yamoja at the very top definitely uh, definitely gives me a little bit of pause. Gives a you little, the willies. Yeah, little, well, yeah, you know what? It gives, it's, it's Halloween. Yep. Or close to Halloween. It's pretty spooky. Yeah. Uh, it's a scary thing to find yourself up against. Uh, and unfortunately for the Kings, the fan vote has only skewed more in favor of the fairy. I mean, probably because of the picks and bans. That's a smite nightmare. That's a smite mare. Queuing into Paul <laughs> nice. and Aurora on Baba and, uh, and Yamoja. And the Camelot Kings had the ability to take those away twice, and they decided against it, which tells me either A, they have an answer for it, or B, they're just looking elsewhere. Remember, last time Quig tried this, he was a little late to the invade. This time he shows up immediately just to slow down the clear. And now Chester can't be pulled. He's just going to be a nuisance toward this buff. Gotta make sure you confirm the purple. That's gonna be down. Green buff also very important. Not like you're gonna be able to kill Quig here, but at the very least, Quig has slowed down their clear, made sure they are gonna be showing up late to lane. And done a number to Aurora's HP because he has to tank those buffs up. The well, last time we saw, and, and specifically we were talking about Cyclone's sustainability, but you've got Yamoji as well, right? So in theory, Aurora should be fine 
but in a little bit. It's going to take him some time to get back there. Four health bots, I'm not worried about him. The good news is, normally you see an invade like that, and, and the conversation is, is very simply put. Man, Quig did a lot of annoying things there, but didn't get any experience. He at least stole, I saw at least one of the smalls, so little bit stripped away, still obviously at a deficit, but it's going to be fun to keep an eye on him, what he's going to do. Had to use the blink early on as well. Maybe that changes something, maybe it doesn't. We also have Twig now on Rat instead of the Hunbats. Feels like something that he's going to be a little more active on earlier on. And so I'm going to keep my eyes on him. Do you feel like... Because last time we were asking for more out of the Hunbats. We were like, we want to see more ults, but there's not really a good option because everybody's got beads. Even by the time he, he felt like there were options, he was like three, four levels down, so it didn't really make that big splash impact play. Do you feel like he's going to be able to be hands-on on the rat and actually get more done for his team? I mean, he's got the blink. He can get involved if he so chooses at the moment, oh, getting no. chased down by Sino. And Paul's got the rotation, but shouldn't be in too much trouble. Dart still available to try and run away. I do think that you can be a little bit more generous with your ganks. Your core not into a great spot, though. But here comes Twig with the gank. The double whoop out of the damage, but they've got plenty to try and chase this down. It gives him a little bit of wiggle room. Cyclone, good jukes, but does eventually get met with his own demise. Hardcore finds the shot. Quig is low, and Sino wants to turn it around, is able to find it, does exactly what he needs. Now are you in a bad spot? Good stun from Twig, keeping things engaged. Aurora's going to be the target. Harcourt's got the shots. Good stun from Aurora, and you got a little bit. The whoop is great, but the rat is greater. Finds that one. Sino again looking to balance things out. He picks up two, loses his duo lane. And what a kerfuffle it feels like over here. But now Cyclone, oh my god, he's been able to respawn and get back in here. And Twig appropriately darts his way on out. I might say around, Quig's been able to respawn. Trelly. Oh, he gets it. Could have been a conveyor belt of a fight. Instead, like you said, falls apart as Twig steals away the shield buff. I mean, gets the shield buff, gets a kill, gets an assist. Not a bad look for the Camelot Kings at the end of that scrap. At the very least, Baskin was able to confirm his own blue buff on the other side of the map. Variety should be getting the better end of these trades just for a bit. Ryzen has a little bit better clear. A lot of sustain baked into the kit. It's going to take a bit before Baskin can confidently bully. But I think getting Yarkora kill and the biggest difference maker, the fact that Cyclone Spin died and got nothing, right? That is going to make the duo lane a lot more difficult. Neath, not really, boxing not really in her strong suit. Put her up against a Freya. It's only going to be worse. <laughs> Your abilities are great, but that's all you have. You miss one spirit arrow, your fighting is gone. Like you, you need to retreat. And Freya has some great chase down potential. If you get a whoop off a backflip, that's a kill. If you're able to connect just one pulse auto, sometimes that's a kill. So I'm thinking Cyclone's been going to have to watch his positioning play very carefully in the Yarkor, especially because level 5 already been reached by the ADC. Good taunt from Quig. I was wondering if it was going to be much of what you had just highlighted. Yeah, when we're talking about, you know, that late game impact from the carries, no offense to me, but Frey is kind of like the late game carry. Like, Katie they, is not going to be happy of this slander. Oh, no, yeah, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come home I'm sleeping on the couch tonight just for talking <laughs> ill about me. Maybe we'll get something, though. You got a lot of damage. Great, great shots. Coming from Cyclone, cleanup kill from Aurora, and the Reverse Rebuke locks down onto Quig. You've got Sino coming Body in to help as well. He's going to blink over the wall. You get one more shot, kill off the support. The chase down is there from the jungler. Forces the ult out of hardcore. Puts him under the tier one, two clean kills. Picked up by the fairy. And this is a big deal. If you're trying to go in for the gank here, as we do see a little bit of a 1v1, Tinks should be able to jump away at any given moment. So no solo kills going to be happening. If Twig ults in, I think that fight goes a lot differently. But as a rat, you're not ulting. Now it looks like he's ulting into mid. Paul does beads, but the stun is also a little bit late. Unfortunate. If you hold that stun, maybe Tings provides the killing damage with an axe throw. Doesn't get it. But either way, the rat doesn't provide so much of the team fight level 5 unless you're using through the cosmos. It's just acorn blast. You get some stuns. You hope that's enough damage. But because... Twig gets caught out. It's a 3v2, by the way. And Cyclone spins, hey, didn't you just use everything? Easy cleanup. Spirit arrow into the weave. Immediately backflip to confirm the kill. And then here comes Sino just to help out over in duo lane. <laughs> That's going to be a good look. We were talking about how Cyclone spin would have some troubles 
Yarkor already finished the hasten ring. If not for that gank, would have been in a bad spot. But not going to be sitting just fine. That kill certainly does help. It gets him into a good spot. You know, we haven't talked too much. It's all been oh, dual no lane, beats. and it's still dual lane. No beads. Maybe no life. Good minion blockage oh, nice. at this point from Cyclone Spin. He doesn't do anything too, too crazy. Just a little bit of pathing. The minions eat up the shots. Keep him alive. And it has been. I mean, dueling. It is all dueling. And for that reason, still a little bit of pressure to be had here. Quig, Harcourt, and Twig, who it. steals it away <laughs> as well for the purple. So they're getting the job done on left. Now, Trelly, we have ignored, much like the players in the game, entirely what is going on on right. And it's because of moments like this. Aurora's getting poked out. Stunned, body blocked, locked up. And what an easy kill for the Kings. And beautifully executed. One more bar of Omi, and Aurora never dies there, but does not have enough for the Riptide. Gets body blocked and just goes down. Unfortunately, Aurora just had no way out. Dropped Bracer just for any bit of movement speed. But that just goes to show, I mean, Twig, in the right place at the right time, shows up with that purple buff, gets the easy steal, then sticks around and says, hey, maybe we can kill Aurora. They get that one as well, the Camelot Kings. Climbing back in, not too far behind anyways. It's like a, not much of a climb, more, more so a step up at this point. But Sino going more of an auto attack build, this nemesis is scaling, right? You're looking towards late game, whereas Rat is his strongest essentially right now up until about, you know, five items. Six items is fine, but you're not gonna wanna take those trades versus Sino later on in the game. Right now, this is when you're able to actually out trade the shield, you know, win your matchups. But Aurora also <laughs> invading these back camps. They don't get much, but they are just trying to Ooh. be annoying. What a great Riptide, though. Forces the dart out of Twig early. And then a Blink even going in. They oh. have some damage, but not quite enough through the Cosmos. Used and used defensively. Twig makes it back to the Fountain. I don't know if this is the fight the Teens really thinks it is. Does a good amount of damage, though. Have to give them credit. Unfortunately, not able to find anything. A lot of poke. Yeah, no blood. Eight minutes in, it's four to three, Trelly. Like you said, though, it's that 800 gold, not a, a whole ton in favor of the Ferryman, but a building block as we start to approach the area. You know, Pyromancer are going to spawn in relatively soon. Gold Fury's been hanging out over there. Last game, we talked a lot about the burn, and with Gold Fury slowly but surely kind of winding its way into this conversation, i got to ask about it because it feels like we're lacking a little bit of burn maybe everywhere. Maybe you got it because you got two auto attackers on the Kings, but I know for sure that the secure that you had with Asilla is definitely going to be missing for him. Is there a, a position right now that either of these teams can feel like super confident pulling it like Gold Fury or Pyra? Yeah, I think that Yarkor still does have some pretty good shred for gold, so that wouldn't be a, a terrible call. Ooh, Quick gets stuck, but that's probably a really stalling. Really good River's Rebuke. That means literally nothing overall. Actually, Aurora might end up getting punished for it. But here comes Baskin, though. They have a little bit of a rotation. Like you said, Baskin actually comes in. Boulder, Boulder over the wall. <laughs> They've got the damage, and they get Quig before he can get into the air. Baskin chased down onto Hardcore. Stun comes out from Cyclone. Push back. going to be there, but he's going to wait out the beads. And beautifully timed, Hardcore goes into the ult. And again, just making sure that they can keep things going their way. Ult from Sino. Burn is there. You need a couple more hits from somebody. And it's going to be Cyclone who ends up finding him. Do trade out. Twig comes in. Massive kill for him. He's going to be dancing under the tier one, trying his best to stay alive. They get rid of Sino. They lose a couple. They keep the kills separated only by two here, but it's the Ferryman in the lead. Yeah, I mean, the Ferryman will take the two for one, but Variety stayed over in solo lane and was able to steal away a lot of farm. Has himself a one-level lead over Baskin. So that's going to be honestly beneficial for the Kings as far as it seems so far. Yeah, I mean, if the six Ferryman were able to pull a Gold Fury or grab a tower off it, maybe that goes a little bit differently, but... Just a bit of an overcommitment there. I think that the, the tower dive on the Yark was the big, you know, maybe we should stop this, but they had enough damage and they said, you know what? What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, quick ulting in and providing a ton of mitigations and making that gank last a lot longer than they probably won the two was the worst case scenario. We haven't got a chance to talk about Tings on the Uller. Uller got some peculiar buffs, and the way the reason I say peculiar is because, sure, extra damage on Blade Arrow, like that's cool, that's yeah. whatever. But the fact that <laughs> instead of popping your two for power as Basket gets ulted on. Uh, Chase is going to be there. Pa oh, man, he has nothing he can do there. Clean execution from Twig. 
And sometimes, Charlie, it's just that simple. Dunk down, stun him, lock him up. You've got a Raijin next to you. You got the damage. They're going to get a kill. They might get the tower, and they might get the blue. They Sino, get Sino is here alone. Luckily for him, goes towards the tower with a blink. Even goes in, has a lot of damage. Twig is low. Sino might be able to do anything, but no, the 2v1. Oh, there's just nothing you can do about it. The damage for the Kings, too strong. They tie up the kills. In fact, they even take the gold lead for the first time this game. I mean, yeah, Captain Twigs, 5 and 1, level 12, three levels over Sino. Didn't seem like a worthwhile kill to even attempt to go for, but mm -hmm. I mean, I guess he saw the, the damage that Cyclone Spin did with World Weaver and said, you know, maybe I can kill here, but you use both dashes to close gap, which means you don't have the dash, you don't have the auto attack cancels to actually use for damage, and that means that fight is just gone. The Camelot Kings pull themselves ahead nicely. And to your point earlier on, the Gold Fury still could be an easy target. Double ADC is going to help out. They've got good burst with Big Man Tings on the Uller. Already has Hydra's Lament, so those auto attacks are also going to be chunking. I do want to see some pressure over on the left side of the map here from the Kings. Sooner rather than later. Grab the beacon, because that looks like it's going to be uncontested. I don't think the Ferryman walk up to this one. And then start to look for, but Baskin actually does make the rotation. Interestingly enough, I mean, Sino's not here, but Baskin's coming from behind. No beads down, but there's going to be a Hercules walking forward. Oh, well, World Weaver going to catch Big Man Tings, but he's over in the green buff, so it's not going to be that big of a stun. Sino, again, down two levels right now. And it's worth mentioning, Boulder thrown, not going to find a lot of damage. Ferryman step up, Twig comes in, stuns out a roar. They separate and they scatter. Right now, Beacon controlled halfway all the way there for the Ferryman. Engage onto Sino. Sino's taking a lot of poke. Double dash, but he goes back to his team. He's just distracting right now. Couple more shots from Hardcore. It's going to be Tings instead who cleans him up. But a kill nonetheless for the King. Cyclone is rotated in. Taunts on the basket. But it's going to be a numbers advantage for the Camelot Kings. Tings is low, has to jump back towards the Tier 1. And as far as control points go, Ferryman still in active control. Tycho drums from Variety. Try to separate things, but it's just not working out too well. Twig now low. Tings has to back to base. And as far as beacon control goes, this one's going to go to the Ferryman. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a little bit more cut and dry, but with the rotation in from Baskin, with the rotation in from Variety, makes things a little bit more interesting. Pulls the beads off of big man Tings. I think Tings played around that World Weaver flawlessly. Doesn't want a beads, knows it's coming. The second it connects, jumps over towards green buff and then joins back in on the fight. Unfortunately, Baskin, you give him three chances, he's going to pick up one. Finally, gets the knockup out of Tings and forces the beads down, so Uller has to play a bit more safe. But Gold Fury is still the target for both of these squads. With Captain Twig this low, I don't think it's going to be under threat anytime soon. It's going to be the end of the scrapping over on the left side of the map. It's I think Cyclone Spin has been good about just hitting his burst damage and sort of staying out of trouble. He knows he's worth you know a decent bit of gold, being 3-1. and one. But hasn't been able to farm effectively because this wave has been very pushed up over on left. He doesn't want to get caught out anywhere near the tower. Yeah. Because Captain Twick could always just ult over. It doesn't matter how far or close you are to that tower line. If we see through the cosmos come through, you're going to be in trouble. So that's why Cyclone Spin's been spending a lot of his time near Purple Bob. <laughs> he doesn't want to give Twig his six kill. Nice, safe place. You know, hang out there. It does, you know, kind of help maybe for Cyclone that since he was, well, we'll call it half a level down from Hardcore, and you specifically that Sino's two levels down, you're probably not looking to get super aggressive unless you're fighting around an objective with your team. Now, you had mentioned it, though, double carry, uh, specifically having you know the attack damage burst that you're going to get from Hardcore, damage from Tings, could open up the conversation, maybe. I have to hold that thought for a moment as Paul gets got on, oh, seems to be pull. just fine, goes into the ult, and again, like you said, a beautiful pull from Baskin, damage is there, and Tings is gone, great engage from the Ferryman, and then the lockdown, River Dubuque forces an ult out of Twig, goes in for a double knockup, onto Sino and Baskin, but the push is good, the CC, the damage not quite there, Quig, TKO, knock back to base, but he's going to avoid the grayscale for now, Pyromancer, and options. I know, walks around the wall, may, throws me for a loop. But it is just going to be the Pyromancer. 15 minutes in, it's halfway down. Variety's still here. Maybe they go for it. Tycho drums come through just a little bit too late. And that one's going to go the way of the Ferryman. Luckily for the Kings, it is not all said and done. They pull the Fury, they're going to pick it up. And they're going to go objective for objective here 
as we tie it up. 7-7, seven, seven, 15 and a half in the gold. Skewing in favor of Chaos. Yep, still a great engage by the Camelot Kings. They sit around, they wait for Paul, they find the beads. Issue, of course, is that if Tinks wants to follow up with the taunt, he's got to be very close. And Baskin was able to pull him back in after the leap out. Did end up using Aegis. Didn't end up mattering because of the damage from Paul and because of the boulder coming through from Baskin. That's going to be a good look. I mean, consistently getting the beads down on Nepal makes the job of killing him a lot easier. The issue is, on Baba Yaga, Paul doesn't die. It just doesn't happen, right? Even if you pull his beads down. We saw last game, Captain Twig on the Hunbats was, was consistently trying to pull beads, pull ult. Wasn't enough. This seems to be that same style of play where, yeah, if Paul puts himself near Quig to get taunted, maybe you find an opportunity for a kill. But that's not going to happen too often. And just now, Prophetic Cloak finished up, so those stacks are going to start roaring in, making Quig's job a lot more difficult. Camelot Kings are once again grouped up to our purple buff. Roar knows they're here, but Big Man Tinks jumps over the wall. There's going to be four at this buff. I'm not sure the Ferrymen want to fight this. Well, they're not going to be successful in securing it for themselves. Oh, here's Baskin Kings again. Steal it. Baskin teleports in, forces out the ult from Harcourt, but it's still playing aggressive. You've got a massive, gotta be massive quick. talent pool over here, and yeah, you got to kill somebody. I think Quig kind of recognizes there's not any getting out of that one. Body blocked against the wall, killed off. Trelly, this one, compared to last game, I mean, absolute bloodbath. 8 to 7, 15 kills, 17 minutes in. The gold is still the kings to control. Tower in mid, taken down by Variety. Has also managed to take down the tier 1 in right. Those are the only two towers that have fallen so far this game. The Ferryman losing a little bit of ground every rotation they have towards left. Twig, I'm gonna look for some poke. Has hardcore. Soon has Quig. Good River's Rebuke. At least locks him away for a little bit. But Twig's up in the air. It looks like Aurora's going to be the target. Cyclone Spin. Uh, we could just play back the comms from a few weeks ago. Let him die. That's exactly what he does. Does not need to fight it. And unfortunately for Aurora, he's the sacrificial lamb. Yeah, Aurora's never going to make it out there. Uh, I've been noticing. I mean, Baskin's making clutch rotations, right? Part of four different kills. Teleports in constantly. But Variety always stays away and actually dashes in, goes for the 1v1, has a 3-level advantage, but here comes the ultimate, the World Weaver might be the difference maker here. It's going to find a little bit of damage, slow down from Sino, double dash to close the gap, Aegis buying some time, but the autos are there, you need one more hit, Sino goes for it under the tower, might lose his life for it, shield pays off in dividends. You've got four more kings over here, what a rotation Blink's got from blink. the Chaos team, Blink's the blink. blink for one, Sino's low, this is going to be a kill, gets a... Big pick onto Variety. Shuts down the Raijin for the first time this game. Ties him up with Twig. Sino, that is, for the first time this game. But still loses his life, Charlie. Yeah, tier one tower will go down. The Camelot Kings, they made a bit rotation over to make sure Sino died. But don't end up going in for a fire giant. They don't feel confident without their fed solo laner around. So they're going to wait for Variety to spawn back in. All the while, finally Cyclone Spin gets some free farm over and left. This man has been just camped up at the tier one tower because of how this lane's been going. Recognizes how strong Yarkor can be in the 1v1. But all the while, Gore, Primal Fury spawning back here shortly. It has been the Camelot Kings around these objectives on the left side of the map consistently. But you've got the Weave explosion from Cyclone Spin, which has been some pretty solid objective confirm. Runic Bomb in pocket for Aurora as well. So as far as objective confirmation goes, it's not like the Camelot Kings can just pull it in the face of the Ferryman. All the while, though, remember, Aurora did use beads last time. He doesn't want to be this far up. There's a lot of Camelot Kings nearby. They're looking for the fight. Nothing big breaking out so far. Pyromancer, Fire Giant, both up on right. And we're 19 minutes in. Both of them can be under threat. As the ferrymen pull this, we're going to listen in with the Kings, see how they take the fight. Oh, my God. I'm ulting, I'm ulting, I'm ulting. Can you go here? Can you go here? I'm taunting them, I'm taunting them. Whoop. I'm on Neath. I'm on Neath. Yeah, yeah, we killed Yemo's one, Yemo's one, Yemo's one. I've got no mana, guys. I'm back. Fire after? Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting shit on. I can't hurt, I can't hurt. Yeah. Beats on him. Can you go fire or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go fire. I don't know if Babra. I don't think. Shut down. Clear, concise comms from Twig, man. <laughs> I, you know what? I know exactly what was happening. And unfortunately for him. He does die. Now, fortunately for the rest of the team, they wipe the floor with the ferryman in that fight, Charlie. I mean, really good aggression, but it all comes down to this. Fire Giant started up. Baskin, Paul, in the area. 
All might go for something. Baskin's got some good pushback. Fire Giant's doing some decent damage. Baskin will get taken out. Do you go for the steal if you're Paul? He's still hanging around. You don't hang this close to the FG unless you're going for something good. Whoop from Hardcore. He gets it! And he gets it! Oh kill. my god, he gets that in! He gets a kill! He might go for a double here! One more auto is all he needs. Won't be able to find it. World Weaver will be taken by Variety. So they only get the one kill, but you get the FG on two. Aurora kills him anyway, so Aurora shows up! Oh no! There's oh. no way! The Camelot Kings pull fire in the face of two. They... <laughs> They get it stolen, and they they lose two as well. Your I, your your face tells the whole tale. Yeah, I'm kind of. You're, this is ridiculous. Uh, I don't. I'm, uh, wordless flabbergasted. There we go. There's. I, I found something way back into this. Luckily. <laughs> Man, they're gonna go for a fight. Maybe I need it right now. If you're the king's twig, goes up to the sky, saves me from having to think about what just happened. And instead goes for the knockup. Cyclone spins the target. Cyclone spin is an easy one to find. Gets rid of him, no problem. But Sino, Sino's back in this game, and he wants you to know it. Takes out Tings to make sure that one goes one for one. He's low, and it will be traded out. Twig with a double is going to keep his chase going. Aurora goes for the well, Riptide to try and disengage. Baskin's still around. And he's going to pull right back to the Hercules. And you're going to have the Baba Yaga coming in. Good damage can happen from Paul. And we see that on the twig. They recognize that on the Kings. Psycho drums get used. Disengage gets used. It's a kill lead for the Kings. Fire Giant for just a roar. Charlie 2000 gold separating them. And what a game these two have given us. Yeah, it has been ridiculous. Baskin really does need to take some time to farm. He's been fighting so much. Level 20 is a massive power spike to try and upgrade that starter item and has not been able to do so. The Camelot Kings. I mean... That steal's going to live rent-free in my mind for a week. 100%. The fact that not only did Paul steal, he killed one, almost killed two, stalled long enough so that Aurora could just walk up and get the second kill. That was ridiculous. But now, the Camelot Kings are still in a good position. It's not as if that Fire Giant steal is the end of the world. It's only Aurora with the buff around his waist at the moment. Tier 1 tower is still available for the Ferryman, that is. So it's not as if they're going to group up and start pushing. I think Baskin needs to AFK and wave. For just a bit. I mean, uh, same for Cyclone. Level 20. Big yeah. spikes to hit. The XP differential is nice starting gotcha. to become a problem. My, same with Sino as well. Let's not forget that he's been going in and dying. Pretty much trading his life more often than not. But still, just going in and dying. If anyone on the Styx Ferryman can die, it has been this nemesis. Yeah, the slash lines for the Ferryman aren't super pretty, right? 4, 6, and 4 for Sino. Like, you've got the kills. You're keeping up in pace. Uh, but most of the time, at least for the Kings, it has been Twig who has been able to find those last hits. Eight and two. Six assists to his name as well. Yeah, maybe farming up. Not a bad idea for him. Try to catch up. Now one level for Variety, one level for Twig. Still two down there that Cyclone needs to find. They're going to set up for a little bit. Gets dangerous territory here, Charlie, right? Pyromancer's just now respawning. Probably something that the Kings, with their positioning, could pull pretty easily. Fire Giant won't be back for a little bit. In fact, Aurora still has it for another 40 seconds. The goal here is not going to be here. Pyromancer, pretty simple pickup. Maybe Aurora will be too. You've got five Kings, one Yamoja. And look, the math adds up on that one. Kings find that kill pretty simply. Luckily, again, for the Ferryman. Aurora's going to be back in time for the next big thing. Level 20 for Sino. Baskin's going to be there soon. Power up for Cyclone, going to be there soon as well. And that's more or less, I think, what to focus on. Towers, or not even the Towers, Titans on the right-hand side. Order's going to be dealt with. And so I'm going to ask you this. Kings, push up with their Titan, fall back to an FG once it spawns in. Where, where do they put their mind? Yeah, I think that's the play. I mean, I would ignore this Titan and just go in for Fire Giant, but they don't have time to it just yet. It's going to take a while to spawn in, so might as well go in for the Tier 2, right? You've got plenty of manpower. Aurora is not going to be here. Cyclone has the ultimate, but isn't going to charge it up, right? He's not as good in an actual team fight. If anything, a fight on a Sino wouldn't be a terrible call. Yarkor makes the rotation over. Now Aurora is back. I guess you have to do with the 50-50. Can you even kill the Titan before the Tier 2 goes down? Looks like it's going to be close, but I think this Tier 2 does drop thanks to the Chaos Titan, so that's going to be more gold in the pockets of the Camelot Kings. They grab two Tier 2s, and they back up, 
FG's not spawned in yet, so they've got time to reset. Get some more ward coverage down. <laughs> and boy, do they have ward coverage yeah, on the right hand yeah, side. That, that's because of the, the ward chalices that Yarkor and Quig have as well. It's it's free. You can just drop as many as you want. Sure, they reset, but anytime you need to... Is anyone over here? Let's just check real quick. All right, I'll back to base. We get to check two more times where any sort of vision in the jungle is. There's almost nowhere the ferryman can go that the Camelot Kings won't know. You know, you mentioned gold. Uh, tier 2 going down and right, tier 2 in mid as well. You're looking at 7,000 and rising for the Kings. They can get the Fire Giant. You have to imagine, it's going to be enough of a lead. Not only do they feel the power spikes, but maybe enough to go for a Phoenix. But, got to get there first. Right now, I, I would even dare to say setting up an ambush, at least waiting around, seeing what kind of poke they can get. Because like you said, with ward coverage... Not a lot of places in the right side jungle the ferryman can stand that the kings won't know about it. Quig knocked up against the wall, maybe saved by that wall. Baskin isn't unable to get the push back into the rest of the team. Sino in right, Cyclone in mid. So scattered engagement for the ferryman if they go for it. Fire Giant's going to be there. And we're still about three minutes shy of it getting enhanced. So now the big question. Can you step up to it earlier if you're the kings? Or do you want to wait for it to be enhanced? I mean, enhanced Fire Giant is great, but it feels like that gives a lot of time over to the Ferryman to, to fight back into this. That's exactly right. You're letting the Ferryman catch up and try and hit some of these big power spikes as well. It's not as if the Camelot Kings are all full studded. I mean, Yarkor needs to sell the recipe. Big Man Tanks need to sell the recipe. Captain Twig still working on Rune Forge. So if you're waiting for those power spikes, it's not a terrible call. It's just... You're also giving the six Ferryman that same opportunity to try and get a little bit tankier, try to do a little bit more damage, wait for those relics to come back up, things like that. It really is just Bracer on Aurora, though, that you'd be waiting for, a second Bracer, because one is already placed. But to your point, it seems like Quig wants to go for a taunt still, right? The last time it was Aurora, he was the pick that started the fight. Doesn't have the beads too often to go off, but looks like they will go in for the pull. Aurora does have his beads back up. Fire Giant's already down to 70%, but the Camelot Kings are taking this slow. Drops it down, gets reset this time. Quig, target for the Ferryman. Fire Giant doing a little bit of damage, but it's kind of scattered. Twig is off to the left, the rest of the Kings off towards the right of the FG pit itself. They're not going to find too much. World Weaver gets thrown out, though, so a little bit of damage stripped away that Cyclone Spin normally brings to the table. Quig goes in, looks for a taunt, finds two. Baskin going to go ahead and eat that damage up front, tries to find a knockup, but unable to now. It's going to be around the Pyromancer. Kings have the pull. A little bit of stun, a little bit of CC for each side. Damage not permanent for either of them. Quig, the lowest of them all. Pyromancer kind of doing his own little dance in the middle of it. Pulled, dropped, pulled, dropped by either squad. Variety could get caught out. Dashes forward. Kings have enough distance. And Trelly, slowly but surely, they're also 8,000. They're at least trying to push towards that 8,000 mark. A Pyromancer gets them into the spot where they have a very distinct, large, large gold advantage. They will, but so far the Six Fairmen haven't been too afraid, if anything. I like the play from Cyclone first off. If you're going to get a, a knee thold off, you'd want it to start the fight as opposed to charging up World Weaver in the middle of the scrap. But goes towards Twig, he immediately knows what's happening, dashes away. The sustain from Aurora has been ridiculous, and that's a big difference maker. If the Camelot Kings don't win the initial engagement, they have to be extremely careful. Pick up the Pyromancer. Two Runic Bombs now in play for the Kings, whereas just one for Aurora for the time being. Does mean that burst around objectives can be a bit clunky. Three different Runic Bombs going in for confirmation towards an Enhanced Fire Giant. <laughs> what, what a way to coin toss the game. But as of now, the Six Fairmen are still on defense. They have... Waves pushing forward. The Camelot Kings don't have much farm to go to, whereas the Six Ferrymen have an endless supply as long as those waves are going to keep pushing. Sino goes back, picks up a Magi. So that's going to be a big deal. One taunt from Quig and being immune could be the difference between living a fight and losing. And remember, this is where Nemesis ult really does start to come into play. We saw Variety step forward, immediately gets his protection stolen, and has to dash out. If you can find a commitment off an ult like that, things go a bit differently. But keep your eyes on Sino, the target of which he, who he ults is going to become a lot less tanky pretty much immediately. And that may just be who the Styx Ferryman turn their attention to. Whereas the Camelot Kings, they've got one plan. Wait for the blink taunt from Quig and repeat the process. Variety dashes forward. Harcore as well uses the whoop. 
That seems to be the go button for the Ferryman. Instead, they're going for variety, and like you said, where Sino goes, the damage Riptide? follows. It's all onto them. No Riptide, or it's just a little late, unfortunately, for a roar. Now the chase is on. Sino leading the way. Variety's one hit from dead, but no one is able to close the gap just yet. Instead, the fight is split. Cyclone, no World Weaver. Variety's going to make it back to base. They need to find a kill. They need to find their presence somewhere else. River's Rebuke comes up, separates the fight. Twig versus Spin on the side. You're getting damage going both ways, but luckily Cyclone Spin has a little bit more help. Twig goes in alone, and Twig pays for it with his life. It's only going to be the one kill, but it's in favor of the Ferryman, and it's a big opener. I mean, the Ferryman were very close to finding that kill on a variety, but Sino just doesn't have enough ability damage, building more towards the auto attack, which unfortunately means that doesn't find the kill. But Captain Twig overcommits towards Cyclone Spin, even with the Hernic Bomb was not able to find that solo kill. The rest of the team comes through and stops it in its tracks. And now the Ferrymen have a commanding advantage towards Enhanced Fire Giant. Still not going to be easy. There's a lot of tanky targets on the side of the Camelot Kings, but they're going to go in for the pull. They're going to pick up the FG. It looks like the Kings are willing to fight this, so let's listen in for the Ferrymen as they try to take it. Can you uh, ult Athena, maybe? Can yeah. you ult Athena? Yeah. I can ult her. I can ult her. Yeah, 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 I ulted I ulted it. I got some. I pulled, pull, pulled. Pull. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Pray, 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 pray. Pray, 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 pray. I'm helping. I'm helping. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going. Kill. Rats up, rats up, guys. Rats up, rats up, rats up. Rats rats up. Rats up. Rats up. Rats can we go uh, fire? Can we go fire? No, I'm poked. No, okay. We have to reset. Really they're, they're taunting. They missed taunt. This we is really we bad. have to stay group. Guys, we have to stay group. Reset, reset, reset. You get to hear it. A lot of coordinated attacks, unfortunately for them at the very end there. Rats back. Shelly, they got a reset. Fire Giant doesn't go either either way. The fight really doesn't go either way. Maybe you can qualify that a win for the Kings with the numbers disadvantage. And we get a small glimpse into what the Ferrymen are trying to do, and right now it is all about that EFG, and also all about trying to deal with hardcore. Yep. I mean, Freya was close to dying, of course, but Yark holds on to Valkyrie's discretion just so well, making sure that, hey, Baskin's going to get some pickups, Bastion's going to get some... You know, some driving strikes, but you got to save that ultimate till the very last second to make sure you're able to live there. Thanks to Quick as well. A defender of Olympus helps out. But now the picks are gone. I mean, it's a, it's a true 5v5 once again. Push back onto Variety. Here comes the World Weaver. Maybe they can go on this Raijin. You've got a little bit of damage. Dash from Variety. It's going to be enough to get him out of there. Sinem holds onto the ult, and I think appropriately so. World Weaver will be back in time. Taunt, though. Comes back now. Baskin pulled in. Roar with him, leading the way. Get the Tycho drums immediately from Variety. He's low. Boulder connects. Rivers of Buke just a little bit late there. And the beads actually work in wonders Dicks. here, but it's not enough. Tings gets deleted. Variety, no way does he come back into this. It could be an easy kill. Twig looking for one of his own. But Sino going to be just fine where he's at. Blink from Twig gets him out of there. I cannot believe Sino and Variety, for that matter, with low health bars, are able to get out. They do. Might be more than you can say for Captain Back Twig. Backflip in. in towards Twig. Autos, good one more hits all you need. And Cyclone finds what he wants. Two kills for the Ferryman and an open fire giant on the right side of the map. Baskin's got teleport, can go back to base, get full HP, and come in for the fight, but stopped by Variety for the time being. It's going to be a five versus three. Here come Quig, here comes Yark, but no relics for the Freya. Do you really want to step up for this? This could be a risky play. Real dangerous territory for the Kings. No matter how things go. World Weaver catches out the dash, but Variety maintains it, is able to find it. Quig is the target. Beautiful up, push. And the damage is good. One more hit, and that's one more kill for the Ferryman. Now, Trelly, looking at this, 60 seconds, full minute. You get Tings back. Hardcore. Relics up in 10, maybe in a good spot to try and get aggressive. Has the ult. No war coverage. They don't know he's here yet. What are they going to do here? Fire Giant, 50% health. Hardcore comes around. Again, no one spotted him out. So he's going to be in a good spot. Either goes for the whoop, maybe just goes for the steel pops. A little bit, misses the whoop, goes for some damage. Aiming for Cyclone, now spotted out. Valkyrie's discretion shots are good, but it's not going to find the kill. Instead, you have to land. That might end up causing his demise. You get one, he's you still lose things. The autos, the damage, the bubble bounce from Aurora finally shuts that one down after losing your own carry. But it is kills, kills, kills for the ferryman. They have gotten almost the full Wipe Twig, the only thing standing between the Ferryman and a Deicide. He's going to stay alive just long enough for Quig to get back onto the map. 
more importantly, stalls out the EFG one more time. And Charlie, what I was going to mention before all of that breaks out, the Kings still have five towers standing. That EFG, if the Ferrymen are able to get it, it's going to be way more massive for them. I mean, we're talking huge, huge amounts of gold into their pockets and a very different map state. But for the Kings right now, defense is the name of the game, and they are playing it well. I mean, it's just that was just a ward diff. The fact that Yarkor can push up wave, show himself on said wave, meaning, hey, guys, I'm right here, and then just walk from behind Pyro through the red buff to behind Fire Giant and sit there just watching EFG be done and then get Cyclone spin to, like, 10% HP by himself is ridiculous. That is a ward coverage differential, and the six ferrymen cannot let something like that happen. The Camelot Kings, though, Captain Twig has been putting on a show. There has been some misses, of course, with the 1v1 versus Cyclone spin. That was a bit of an overextension, but killing Paul there is a big deal. Run, the, the, the pathing that he took to get out to make sure that Baskin and Aurora couldn't find him stalls out the rest of his team spawning in. Been very impressed with the rat play so far from the Camelot Kings. And Captain Twig's been on the forefront of just about every one of these engagements. Been a part of 16 of the 19 kills. Yeah, think about it though. Twig, like you said, huge impact, and that cannot be discredited. But was 8 and 2, now is 9 and 4, right? 1 and 2 since that last check in. Meanwhile, it was 4 and 6 for Sino, now 7 and 6, right? 3 and 0. Oh. Maybe that's going to showcase where these junglers kind they're of just goes into the Cyclone? conversation. They're going for Cyclone. I don't know if it's the right call, but they're looking for it. There's going to be Twig, and he finds the kill onto Variety anyway. Goes one for one, and meanwhile, the rest of the Kings aren't winning their own fight. Sino gets taken down by Hardcore, so you keep it two for two as the trades come out. And Hardcore needs a little bit of help. Twig going to isolate Paul, and with some Hardcore shots, it's going to take him down low. Cauldron does a lot, though, and leaves Twig in an isolated area. Just yes, around Mike. the corner, dodges out the L and is able to get away for a little bit, but not away from Baskin's waiting arms. Now Paul goes in. You have to be careful here. Quig is going to be enough to find that kill, Trelly. So many deaths in this one. Only three left standing. I mean, they're and not killed to, Quig. But if, if they do, it's going to be a long burn. I can't play-by-play play the whole of that. But it is just front lines left. And what a, a dive from the Kings to try and make sure that the carries from the ferryman can't get anything done. I mean, what a split team fight, though. Cyclone Spin has to take an isolated 2v1 versus Captain Twig and Variety. Ends up winning that 2v1 as far as I'm concerned because he kills Variety. Sure, Twig picks up that, that pick. But then Twig's out of position. He has to blink out. Baskin, so many pulls on this Hercules. The CC has been incredible. The issue, of course, is that Yarkora lives way too long. And Freya, the only damage dealer alive at that point, right as Paul goes down. Man, the, the back and forth has been ridiculous. Finally, the six ferrymen have the one-man advantage for, I don't know, four seconds before Captain Twig spawns in. He will have ult to get back in this fight. But remember, Cyclone Spin is not an auto attacker. This fire giant is not going to go down quickly. And here comes the rest of the Camelot Kings. The runic bomb in the pockets of both supports here as well. Cyclone has been the target from Variety. He's going to go in deep. Quig takes a lot of poke. That might be a big win in and of itself. World Weaver used, beats, oh. met, pull. Good wall, a little stronger in this case. And Variety manages to avoid his demise one more time. Meanwhile, Shelly, we're on the beacon part five at this point. That's going to go over towards Tings. Is this Titans again? I think there's one more before Titans. Oh, okay. But we're almost at Titans again. Honestly, with the pace of this game, I think we're going to see Titans again. Uh, it, it does There's seem like There's still five like towers standing for the game. Like, not one has changed in the last five minutes. I mean, it's just been so back and forth. Whoever can fin get a pick and finish it is going to be a big deal. Poke is also massive. Paul forced into the ultimate because of the taunt from Quig, but why not turn that into a positive? Just poke out everyone on the side of the Camelot Kings. Unfortunately, poke means nothing because the six ferrymen can't do EFG quickly, even if they get... Three members of the Kings back. The second that Quig and Variety show up, they have to get off. They cannot risk the 50-50. And Hans Fire Giant is going to blow this game wide open. And no one has been able to commit to it just yet. Paul, no ultimate, gets taunted back in. The beat's already down. And here comes Twig. Has the stun, immediately goes for the damage onto the Baba Yaga. And that's where Variety it comes in. Tycho drums, damage is good. And they've got the lockdown. Get rid of the mid laner and finally put him down. Unfortunately, you've lost your own in the process. One, six, and nine for big man Tings. 
And it doesn't look like that's going to change. Cyclone and a little bit of pressure by Quig. Variety in pressure by Beautiful Baskin. Beautiful driving strike. Immediately from the dash, like you said, a great driving strike. Make sure this one's one for two. Sino once more. No blink dash, dash two. for either jungle. Oh, the Good stun. stun from Twig. And man, it's exactly it's what you need. It's nothing. To just get us into a reset <laughs> and keep things right where they were. It, I'm telling you, if Cyclone <laughs> Spin is on any auto attacker, this is massive. But because it's Neath, this They're is still so it. sketchy. And look, guess what? Yark is still here. He's going to be close by. There's going to be a Freya with no rugs walking in any time now. Here comes the Camelot Kings 3v4. Fire Giants getting low. And Twig goes to the sky. Yeah, up in the air. Hardcore again right here. Half health on the Fire Giant. You got to be careful if you let this drop because they might just go for it. Twig seems to be a little bit alone right now. Baskin doing numbers in the back to make sure that the rest of his team is safe and isolated from the engagement of them. Great double push as well. Keeps Twig engaged, but it's just kind of Baskin versus the world. The rest of the Ferrymen, not in the conversation. Sino, Paul, back to base. Like you said, Cyclone <laughs> Spin does not have the auto attack damage for an FG. Nope. And I'm gonna go ahead and say didn't have the ability damage for the fight, so instead Shelly reset. Everyone's back on the board. Relics are a nightmare. Ults are coming back up. And we'll wait a little longer to see who can get this Fire Giant. Gore, can I just say <laughs> that I'm not completely certain that Paul didn't get his first Baba Yaga death this game, but he's got four. And yeah, I know I for a genuinely was going to call it his first of the game. I'm pretty sure that's his first. <laughs> I think that's Paul's first Baba death of the season, and now he's got four. <laughs> that just goes to show how much pressure Quig and Twig, the Camelot Kings duo, are putting towards the Baba Yaga. Unfortunately, there hasn't been too much pull onto the enhanced fire giant because it's just scary stuff. The second primal fury goes down though. The six fairyman, no. There's two people not here. Maybe they can step forward. Maybe they look for an ultimate from Cyclone. There it is on a quick. Can they even kill him in time? Well, Rivers Rebuke locks him down. Nope. But yeah, if you've got Athena ult, that's going to get the disengage out towards hardcore. Twig's far enough back. Charlie, I'm going to give him credit, though. We have seen several EFG <laughs> dances that have lasted 15. I mean, this this has been from Fire Giant Spawn. I, if, I don't know if you remember. I asked at like 27 minutes if the Kings were willing to wait until it was enhanced. So we've been going for a little while. And the Ferrymen have <clears throat> essentially evened up the gold yeah, in that time. <laughs> evened up the gold. The thing I was worried about, and, you know, we see this a lot. We'll have, like, these 15, 20-minute Fire Giant dances where, like, nobody does anything. We've got tons of fights in the meantime. It's just no one's been able to get the objective. Ferryman going to start for it. 50% health. Let's call it 55 on the Fire Giant. York pulled back and in. And double, two, double pull, double push, maybe. Wait York for Baskin. Die. Hark goes up to the sky. No beads, no Aegis. you got to get the chase. Instead, it's Baskin versus the world on his own deep in the FG pit. Nothing. Parkour, Twig managed to make it out with low health bars. So do Baskin and Sino. And Charlie, we're back at square one. Nice reset for the boys. And all ten players get the patience they need. Runic Bomb in pocket. For Quig and for Aurora. Maybe looking for a little more here. Pyromancer could get pulled. Baskin looking for a pull, unable to find anything. Eats a lot of poke for his troubles. It's going to be a retreat. From Quig. Oh, he's in, he's in combat. Can't do it. Twig walks up as well. Has the scorching blink. Baskin <laughs> has been uh, putting on a show as well, man. If I'm giving credit it's to Twig, I got to put on. Baskin as well. So many pulls back in, but his team just does not have the damage to finish. They don't have the chase down that Captain Twig has. If Sino was able to go up into the sky and fly to the background, yeah, maybe you finish some of these kills, but they just don't have the DPS. Paul, great poke from this Baba Yaga, dishing it out consistently. Aurora, keeping everyone full HP. Does not matter. The Gamelot King's variety gets his beads pulled, taunt back in. Baskin, he doesn't care about that damage. That's the, the glory. Look, Baskin, I, I think you, you are right on the money. 6, 2, and 11. I would even wager maybe the only reason they've been able to find half the kills they've been able to get have been Baskin. Uh, not just because he's affected 18 of 26, but just the pulls, the knockups, the, the, the presence that this Hercules has left on the map. Massive, massive plays for the ferryman. You just got to think they've been wishing. I mean, look, this fire giant. At this point in the game, if you get a four-man wipe and you can just avoid losing more than two in the process, you might not even need the FG. You could probably just win. We're 45 minutes in. Neither team has felt 
Trelly, to, to me at least, in control of the Fire Giant Pit at, at any <laughs> given time this game. Yep. The one time the Kings had it, the Ferrymen were able to steal it, so we'll see. I forgot about that. That was big. That it's, was a, that was a while ago. Yeah, good for. I mean, it's been legitimately almost twenty-five, maybe almost thirty minutes since that happened. And it's been almost twenty minutes of just watching them stare at each other. I can tell you one thing: at the end of this game, if I guarantee you, Cyclone doesn't go back to Neath at the very least. Like he's like, dude, this give, was a third pick, Neath. He's like, dude, give me any hunter that can do crit, please. We need to go in quick. Once again, do they have the damage to burst him? No, they're gonna give up on it. But Captain Twig goes to the backline anyways. Relatively deep. Does he get out? And the answer so far is yes. Beads used by Paul, though, and ult. But they're going to get the push. Finally, the pull, and it's back. Just push of course, forward. Who leads them exactly where they need. They're not going to push forward, though. They're going to ignore no you. No way. And they're going to go for this ever-coveted, ever-wanted enhanced Fire Giant Trelly. Again, they still have five towers that they have to burn through. And the towers themselves. Is Yark going to clear the wave and go from behind again? Yeah, look at the ward coverage. That's something that's going to be scary for them to go through. Twig Dash is good. Baskin wants some blood. Isn't going to be able to find it. But the towers, not important for gold, not really important for the control on map, but are important for the health they, they give to it. the Titan. Fire Giant. They've done it. Variety's gone for 40 more seconds. And the zone is there, enhanced fire giant after almost 20 full minutes. Jenga. It goes to the ferryman. <laughs> they did it, Gore. I'm amazed. I thought the ferryman were just going to book it up mid lane and completely give up. But the Camelot Kings decide too many relics down, too scary to walk forward. There's no way they are contesting. And we also made it to the Titans walking once again. Baskin is going to send them out. Variety back up in eight seconds. But Enhanced Fire Giant is the difference maker. Left lane, here they come. Cyclone's been lost lane so hard that Tier 1's still up at 50 minutes, but they're going to go <laughs> knock it down with the help from their Titan. That's an old joke. If you guys haven't been watching Smite for a while, first person to get Tier 1 tower loses lane, or get wins lane in that regard. But Cyclone, he never pushed. He's going to sit back, charge up the World Weaver, see if anyone shows themselves. Don't think it's going to happen. But with Enhanced Fire Giant in play, Sino, Baskin, they could just solo a Phoenix at any given moment. But the Camelot Kings, they don't want to defend underneath the Phoenix. They're going to go for a risky play. They're going to step forward here. Quick has the Blink Taunt. Who's he going to go for? Baskin's the only one walking up. He's popped an Elixir of Defense. I'm not sure that's the one you want. Baskin taunted in. Takes a decent amount of damage. About a third, maybe call it two. Arcor takes more. Bar, but Arcor, yeah, takes not only more, but as the chase is on, can Roar get back there, find some CC? The answer is yes, they get to him, and they take out the Freya. That's a huge pick, and now a huge River's Rebuke. Bigger pull from Baskin. Great plays from the front line on the Ferryman to just queue up their team. Unfortunately, the Kings have retaliated. Twig is chasing it down. Twig, no. Roar, but no, it's Cyclone. Style points kill with the backflip. Takes out Twig and is looking for variety. Baskin leads the way. They pulled them in, Trelly. It took them a long time to get here, but they've got control of this game now. They still have to kill Titans. But Titan. they have so much work to do before they can get there. 70 seconds without Quig, 60 without Twig, and 40 without Hardcore. And Variety has not left. He's still pumping damage through the perp above. Cyclone's been backflips in, trying to chase this one down. Take a look at Big Man Tink's relics. He's got them both beads down towards the World Weaver. Titan. Full HP, running down left lane. Tier 2, Phoenix end. That's got to be on the mind of the Styx Ferryman. But Yarkor is going to be back up in 20 seconds. Can the Camelot Kings hold out? FG enhanced. This should be a pretty simple Phoenix. Maybe you can go for a kill, knock up onto Variety. But again, the wall saves his life. But it only saves it maybe for a little bit. Dash gets him back to the Fountain. Hardcore back in five. But the Titan is the goal. And it looks like that's going to be all they need. Ferryman in 49-35 are able to find this win and go up 2-0 over the Ferryman. I mean, it was pick after pick. Both teams put on a fantastic showing of how to dance around an enhanced fire giant. Didn't really seem like there was much of an advantage. It was just the one pick where the ferryman decided, you know what? We are going to be able to commit. <laughs> and I got to give huge shouts out to Baskin. I mean, you don't even find... Quig's job is so easy, right? It's very simple to hit those dash taunts. And still, he was on point. Shouts out to Quig as well. But Baskin landing so many pulls. Sino was able to chase down so many kills to confirm those kills, despite not having that, that semi-global presence that Twig had, was still able to get involved. This was just a fantastic game back and forth, but 
Someone had to come out on top, and this time it was the ferryman. And you know, and, and that fight. The thing is, again, you know, we're, I'm used to seeing. And in some circumstances, we'll have 15-minute fire giant dances. Yep. And it's, well, I poke you a little bit, I drop some wards, you clear out my wards, you poke me a little bit, and then you clear out my wards. And, and that's going to be the dance. Yep. There were kills, there were fights. It just it came down to, and you highlighted it a ton, it's just that unfortunately for Cyclone Spin, they could not kill the FG fast enough until eventually they could, and they finally get there. They win that one 2-0. Uh, but that does not showcase how well the Kings fought back in that. We'll have to yep. see if they have a little bit more in the tank. So they've got one more to go at least right after this quick break.
Welcome back, Smite fans. After a barn burner of a game number two, Six Ferryman hold on to the lead 2-0. You still have Frogs, still have Inbound on the desk. And, man, I don't even know what to – that was 49 minutes, almost 50 minutes. You, you get a complete banger. And, and the Six Ferryman, they take it in the end for, for sure. But, I mean, the Camelot Kings, they look pretty solid fighting back. If I told you a 50-minute game happened and there's only one Fire Giant taken – they were fighting for like 25 minutes around that fire giant. It was like three for threes, two for twos, two for fours. And nobody could get that upper hand. But, I mean, that King's early, that King's mid game was exceptional. Twig on this rat. Yep. I maybe under underappreciated how much he was going to do on it into the in, in picks and bands. But he really did put on a performance. And this big fight around, you know, that shield buff in that early portion kind of told you what was going to be happening in this game. And then Lot this, of, of course, the steal. <laughs> Yeah, how, how does Paul get that? Oh my goodness. He just walks up, takes the first fire giant, and then, of course, that 20-minute fight around EFG before they inevitably get it. I mean, such a back-and-forth one in, in the mid-stage of the game. And, you know, I think a big takeaway for, for me, and maybe a big takeaway for the Kings, is Paul is killable. This is, I mean... On Baba. Right, on, on Baba. You... As, as a note to the to the fans watching, his KDA that game goes from 40.5 before this game on, on Baba Yaga goes all the way down to 12.6. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. 12 KDA is pretty good. Except like, I'm not complaining about a 12 KDA, but they kill him. He goes, he's deathless on this pick, and they kill him four times this game. And I'm just, I, I mean, they have to be happy with the way that they were playing those fights, even if they didn't come out with the win in the end. They, they definitely have taken a very solid step forward in this set. You saw how kind of sloppy those late, games, late game fights were. That's exactly how you want to play against a team like the Ferryman with this type of comp. So much backline. I mean, Aurora's healing 30,000 health through the entire game, which is crazy. Baskin has so much pluck potential. sino has got all in potential. But how the Kings played this late game team fight is how they need to play to beat the, the Ferrymen if the Ferrymen are going to play something like this comp again. I think the Baba is something that, they, that they've shown they can play into. It's still just so good. Just ban it. And you, you compare how much the Baba did to this Uller. And, I mean, I mean 50,000 damage apiece. Not to take away from that. But Paul died four times. Seven times to the Uller. The Uller only was a part of ten of the kills and assists. 12 or 16 on the side of, of the Baba. Right. And if you saw how those late game fights were playing, 
Uller was just unable to kill this Hercules. Felt like a non-factor, absolutely. I mean, and Big Man Tings traditionally a little bit more of a of a mage player, right? He he's got the AOE picks. He's played the Discordias, the Scyllas before, right? That we just saw. I almost would have rather had him on one of those AOE mages because I feel like that would have done so much more for that in that mid game. But I also think that the Uller was a big part of them getting through the early game. And they also kind of had to pick another physical god if they go for that Scylla, any other mage. They're rocking three mage gods, one guardian, right. and then their only physical is the the Ratatasker, who's not a physical god you want kind of carrying that physical side of things. But I think there's th things they can take from this, which is the positive. Absolutely. Picks and bands for game number three. And notably, the Camelot Kings, they were happy with the draft strategy they chose in game number two and in game number one, I suppose. And they go right back to it. They've chosen this second pick once again. And already we're seeing some differences. This Amaterasu, not the first ban for the Kings. Instead, they've chosen to take away that Chernobog, which they, you know, they've done before. But this might leave them with an extra ban slot to take away that Baba Yaga. And that is what we wanted to see. When we talked in the back, we were talking about what are the two gods you do not want the Ferryman to get. We decided on... Chernobog and Baba. Everything else it, it, you can play into, you can play against, and they look worse off of these. And now you get rid of these two. This is the game that I'm now focused on super hard, where if the Kings can play as well as they did in that second game, and they pick and, and draft and don't allow the Ferryman to play as good of a comp, they 100% have the greatest chance to take this third game. I like the Baba band, don't get me wrong. I'm still worried about the Emoja. Full stop, because you're absolutely right. You were right to point out the 30k healing that this pick does. Notably, Twig only does 33k damage last game. He he was facilitating a ton. I loved him on the Ratatosker. But 33k damage from a jungler, 30k healed from the enemy support, almost just completely neutralizes that amount of damage coming through. And I think Quig looked great on the Athena, but... Aurora look like I don't know if you can give that if those are the top two to target out I wonder if they'll try to ban away one of those supports here and, and it's interesting the Priority the shift that we've gotten like now We're not necessarily as focused on those mage solos more maybe on these supports that have been in each game But with this up wash taken away the Raijin available on the ferryman go towards that one and the Kings, or, or sorry, excuse me, the Ferrymen seem happy to kind of pick the support that the Kings don't pick. Two times now they've prioed the Athena, this time switching it up, drafting that Yamoja. I'm happy to see the switch up. The Athena looked great, yes, but when you see that late game potential of Yamoja, it's insane how much he's able to do. Pairing it with the Erlang also gives you a pseudo frontliner and another engaged tool if you are opting to play another mage in solo. And when we see this Ryzen locked in, a lot of times, the mage that's answered is that MLF, so that's something we'll have to keep an eye on when it gets to the king side again. But the Athena pick and the Neath hover. The world is no wow. Thoughts on the Neath? Th my thoughts. Yeah, on I want. I'm curious what you what think. I th I don't know. I have no thoughts on the Neath, man. I, I mean, Cyclone Spin was a little bit lower in damage last game than the Freya, which is. I I almost think it's more of a question of where is Yark's damage as opposed to. I'm amazed that Neath is keeping up, but it, like it just feels, if, if they're having trouble dealing with the tanks, then Neath is certainly going to have trouble dealing with the tanks. Now that'll be a question of, I mean, we talked earlier on the desk, Variety, he, he's like to go to these Guardian solos. He's like to go back to these Warriors. We had a Hercules last game, which Big Man Tank struggled to shred down on the Uller. I wonder if this is something they try to take advantage on. Maybe you pick the Ama yourself and, and put it on Variety and then you try to take advantage of the fact that they don't have a, a Kins Hunter. They don't have this shred coming from the dual lane. And that's actually a good highlight that the Amo was the two bands in, or two of the bands in game one and game two. And it is open for the Kings to pick here. And we've seen them play it more than just in solo lane. We have seen Yark take this too. This is something that they prio and they want to play. It is not wow. something they opt to yet. They picked this Wukong. Wukong is a fine character. End of story. He's a fine character. Is he going to be able to do as much as the Ryzen, uh, the Herc that Baskin did last game, even an Alma in this spot? I am not a massive fan of the Wukong here when there's so many other valuable picks up, even that MLF to match into the Ryzen. But I, it's fine is where I'm kind of getting at. It. It's an okay pick. I feel like it's, it's hard to have a bad Wukong. 
Yeah. It, it's hard. Even even way back when, when like Athena was, was not the greatest, it's hard to not get value out of Global Pressure and Taunt. It's hard to not get value out of damage and innate safety, right? So Sun Wukong, he's the pick here. I, I'm with you. I'm a little bit surprised, admittedly, that it's not the Amaterasu coming through, given how much priority they were placing on that ban. But now, in the second phase here, they take away the hell from Paul. They take away the Hun bats potentially from Sino if you were to go towards that pick. I mean, what do you think about these top threes? The Camelot Kings, they have the top three from the Ferryman's game number one, just with Wukong over Baba. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like a big part of it. Yamoja Baba is such a good 2v2 together because you don't need to set up for Baba. She does enough damage. Her damage isn't hard to hit. She kind of just throws it and it zones. You have to be able to find a mage that has some survivability, but then can also, you know, either set up for themselves or not need too much setup. It's kind of like the Ryzen, where Ryzen doesn't need a ton of setup. He's got it set up for himself. He's got just good damage also. What will the Kings look for? Sill is an option. We saw the Scylla game one. You really liked it. I thought it was really, really good too. And they have good setup for it. They're going to pick for the Hachiman now. Wait to see what the entire Fairman comp is going to be. But that Scylla, I think, is something we should consider for this Kings comp. And we have seen the Hachi in mid once upon a time, True. so could put maybe be a little bit of flex potential, but I mean that would be that would be dangerous. That would be four physical if you went another hunter, which I'm not sure you're great at, at you know putting all in on one damage type. But these last couple of picks for the ferryman, the MLF coming through. Got to think that that's for Paul, but you know they could switch the Raijin and the Morgan around a little bit if they want to, but. We've seen Paul on this pick a little bit, and he goes towards it late in the draft, wondering where they're going to go for Sino. This Nemesis still available, the Surter, the Nike still available, E-Set, Oleron's banned away. Unfortunate. I'm, just, I'm just like listing all of the all of the Sino gods that he could come through, but there's still so much on the table for these assassins. And I think uh, Lance is maybe something to consider because part of the resurgence of Twig was he played that Lance and that was kind of like his best god. So maybe it's a pick away here. Do I think it's in a great spot? I think it's fine. I like that Wukong, I think it's a fine pick. I think it would mostly be just to take it away from Twig because Twig has really only played four gods. Rat, Erlang, or sorry, Rat, Hunbots, Lance, Lance, and Erlang. So yeah, I guess it really has only played those four. If that Lance isn't there, what is Twig going to, you know, default to next? I think he's got the Erlong on the side of their trap oh, thus far. Sometimes you sometimes you make mistakes. Well, that, that's a mistake right there. I mean, the, the, the Amaterasu pick, that might be a mistake from the Ferryman because that is, is that an Amaterasu ADC? It's jungle. Well, no, it's, Who's going to jungle? Oh, I think okay. that's how we have to find oh, it. It's got to be jungle. I think I messed you up with what I said it's about be. Twig. It's got to be jungle. But we've also seen... A tiny bit of MLF jungle. No. I'm not saying no. it is. I'm saying there is potential there. You can't bait me into that. I'm not. I'm not giving it to you. Amaterasu jungle. That's my prediction. I. Uh, I. I cannot find Solace. I mean, Sino's. Sino is a mage player, right? He. He likes the. He said he likes the all run. We've seen MLF now. I didn't expect to ever see her in solo, and and now we've seen that a number of times. So who knows where where the pressure is. If this is Amaterasu jungle though, and 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 all the while the kings have like known about it, they've been like, dude, Sino has been wrecking people in scrims with this Amaterasu jungle. We have to take it away from him. They've been like banning it away from Sino specifically, and now it, it goes to him. I mean, it was a pick they were worried about, and now the ferrymen have it, so I'm we'll have to see what they do with it. And that's just to say this ferryman comp still has that little bit of flex potential. We are leaning towards the Ama jungle a little bit, but there is still potential for this Ryzen to be, you know, the mid laner, because we've seen Paul pilot this. We've seen Ryzen in solo. Ryzen in jungle, probably not happening. But there is just a lot of flex potential on the side of the Kings. And that's also on top of Nice played mid before. Ama's played ADC before. There yep. is even more, like, strangeness that could ha happen with this, this Styx Ferryman comp. So not even limiting it at just who's jungling, it's who's playing everywhere. But I want to talk about this King's last pick, this Tiamat. This was a perfect round out to this comp because it is exactly what they need. Somewhat survivable, so the Yamoja is able to keep her alive. Very good poke, isn't reliant on CC. She can get through the early game with the help of the Erlang, the Wukong, and somewhat Hachiman style. This King's comp, 
is very self-sufficient su sufficient as a whole. And this Ferryman comp is very exploitable in that late game. Obviously, we're going to have to see where stuff goes. But I'm really liking how the Kings have kind of drafted this game. Yeah, they, they have a little bit of everything in this composition. You get some safety from the ADC and the mid laner, both very, like, self-help picks, right? Like, you, you are able to keep yourself alive in the team fight without having needing the peel necessarily, but then you have a ton of peel because you have this emoji, you have the healing coming through. I mean, Quig and Aurora switching the supports. I mean, that's one thing I can feel confident about in the Ferryman draft. This Athena sure. is going to be in support, right? I feel confident about that. And this time, switching around the supports, I mean, do you think this this benefits the, the dual lane slightly for the Ferryman? Now it's Neath plus Athena versus Gimoja plus Neath? Uh, th this Neath just feels like it doesn't fit the comps that the, the Ferrymen have been drafting that much. They're not playing these full dive comps where that Neath ult is able to carry up. I do think that the Athena helps a little bit because Athena is going to be wanting to start fights with that dash taunt. There is good follow-up on the dive. There is now double global on the side of the Ferrymen. They have the Athena, the Neath ult. Th this is still like the thing that I'm coming back to is this Neath just makes the comp for this Ferryman side just weird on how they want to play because they want to play front to back but Neath doesn't have consistent damage he's like a burst god well close game number two brings the energy for game number three backs up against the wall the kings have to push us if they want to stay alive in this set for game number three we'll throw it to the caster thanks so much frog and inbound and Shelly, they got a lot to live up to after that game two and it's going to be gore the aforementioned Trelly, and of course Doug, who's going to give us the views in. And more importantly, Trelly, I want to see what the fan vote is on this one, because that was so heavily skewed, you know, 50 minutes of gameplay. I want to say it was, what, 83-17, something like that. Goes back down 7-3 to 27 in favor of the Ferryman still. And Trelly, I got to ask, specifically, going from game two, 50 minutes to... <laughs> Man, to game three where Sino's playing Ama Jungle. Are you feeling the 73% in favor of the Ferryman? I mean, it's not it's not the strongest in terms of early pressure. Uh, it's going to help your your actual firefight. You know, if, if the issue was, hey, we couldn't do Fire Giant quickly, throw an Ama in the mix, right? That, I said that Cyclone would not go back to Neath, and he did. But, so now they, on your face. but now they've got Ama, so you know that'll help them do Fire Giant quicker. Ama full damage, which is never how Sino builds, but to the point. Ama full damage does have some decent shred. Her abilities can chunk. I, I assume he's going to build pretty similarly to the way he played Nem, with like an Atalanta's into some ability damage. It's still, you know, more auto attack as the build runs through. But l definitely less instant CC than Captain Twig, and I think that's the big strength of the Erlong, right? As you can CC so quickly. Captain Twig taking a lot of damage here. Paul on the Morgan Le Fay is something I do like to see, though. Uh, if it was between Ryzen and MLF, I like the MLF in mid and the Ryzen building tanky. I like that a lot better just because I think Ryzen likes to dash in more, whereas Morgan Le Fay can do that damage from a distance pretty easily. We'll have to see how Sino pilots this pick. I mean, once he gets level 5, if, if he gets some dazzling offensives off, if he's able to force some ganks, we'll have to look. I wanted to see, well, he just used his whole cycle of abilities. So cooldowns exist. The basket playing aggressive, variety on the Wukong. This is a god that is known for his ability to stay alive versus a god that I feel like is quickly risen in terms of kill potential and kill conversation in the Raijin. So definitely. Who's he risen? Who's he risen? Yeah, you said he's risen. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of no. I'm trying to think of a real good joke, man. I'm trying, I'm I'm trying to find it. Is, is there somewhere in there? I just, There's like a King Kong in that like whatever the name of the blonde lady that he climbs the Empire State Building with. I did see that movie, but I don't know her name, unfortunately. <laughs> Who does it? <laughs> the most recent King Kong that mattered was versus Godzilla, and that was cool. That's not quite what that lane's going to be. It's going to be more like just I guess Raijin versus Wukong. Yep. Still two gods. I'm curious to see how it goes, though, for Baskin. If, if it's going to be this, you know, super aggressive chase people down, or if it's going to be maybe kind of a nothing burger for a little while, right? I mean, last time, last game, like, we didn't even talk about Solo Lane for 18 minutes. I, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it was something similar. There is going to be an, at least an attempt at a blue buff invade because Variety's HP and his mana is not looking great. 
So when Sino comes over, he says, hey, you know what? Let's go in for the invade. He's got eyes on Captain Twig, so he knows Twig's not a blue buff yet. Yeah, if I'm Sino, I'm just chasing Twig out here, and I'm telling I'm telling Basket, meet me at this blue buff pretty much immediately. And if that's the case, remember, in game number one, Variety died for this blue buff in a very similar position. Maybe Captain Twig dies for the blue buff this time around, because Basket's going in. Got to silence out the dash. There's the beads. Oh, he misses. And yeah, unfortunately for Sino, does not connect, and that means that... Twig at least is able to walk away from that one. Now, Variety might not be able to say the same thing. Baskin goes in. Luckily, the tower... Oh, he no, got it! The tower he didn't got even it. help Baskin under the Tier 1, right behind Variety and under his nose. Takes out that blue buff and secures his own... Wait, he just burned it in. Burned it in. He's down a level. Is this an opportunity? Well, Sino absolutely abandoned him, so probably not. And now with the ult there for Variety. Maybe he comes out, no first blood, but a successful invade on the blue and some great poke from the ferryman. Yeah, I think level four bird in there, if Sino's nearby, definitely results in at least an attempt at his life before Somersault Cloud comes through, but Variety will be just fine for the time being. Either way, level five comes through quick. It's a beautiful rip. Oh, just barely walks out. That is unfortunate. Quick plays that flawlessly, man. I mean, Riptide into the stun, pulls the beads, backflip, gets the River's Rebuke down, but Cyclone Spin just barely walks through the wall before it comes up. I appreciate how often Cyclone Spin goes into the World Weaver, but I'm going to be honest. He's, he's He gives me false cues every single time where I'm just like, who's he going to shoot? It, it's shooting? like the Merkel where you just charge it up. Just you know, yeah. for the, It's for the fear, you know? Or just because it's a fun ability like to spam, I guess. You also do, I will admit, look pretty cool when you, you drop down. I guess the world little... slows down around you. The noise comes in. I agree. I mean, I, I do the same thing. <laughs> for cool factor alone. We'll see what Cyclone does with it. We were, I mean, you were asking for last game, like, way more World Weavers in general. But yep. then by the time we got to the point where they would have been, like, super helpful, it's, hey, if you go to try and World Weave this in the middle of the fight, you will just die. So, big opener for the squad. We haven't talked too much about the Tiamat, right? You, you know, the Mildred we just saw looked good. We saw Erlong in game one. Wukong comes around every now and then. We spent some time on, on the Ama in the jungle. And Hachi's kind of a regular stay over there as of late in the duo lane anyway. Tiamat has been more of a fringe pick. And it definitely feels like there's only a few going for him. I don't hold that thought. Stun good from Sino. Is he looking for it? No. It will not be the first blood healing was good from Twig, but Sino does not back away. At least not yet. Forces Twig to go under the tier one. And no first blood there. That being said, with Twig and Variety gone, this blue buff comes in. Might be the easiest one the ferrymen have to steal away. Some experience, some gold in their pockets, and they're going to look good for it. But back to the Tiamat Trelly, which is just, what does it bring in for Ting's? Uh, that maybe he couldn't have found on, on any other pick. I mean, if you think about Twi Ting so far this game, or the set rather, I mean, the Scylla, for me, was a little bit off the mark. Didn't connect nearly enough to, to you know, to warrant being picked up. That was game one. Game two, the Uller was interesting, but unfortunately for Uller, you're out of position a lot. It's just you have no CC immunity, so you got to be killing or just poking. And... That's not really where Uller succeeds. He wants to be getting aggressive, find those axes. In this matchup, the Tiamat provides overwhelming safety. It's going to be hard to dive. Slow early game, but the games have been slow anyways. And just pretty solid, you know, all-around damage late, late on, right? That, that Tornado can be fantastic, but Aurora definitely going to get caught out here. Does the damage come through to kill him? Can he ult out? Doesn't seem like it. I think Aurora's going down. Yeah, that's cut and dry. Body block CC. Uh, but more importantly, what you highlighted, damage from Twig and from Hardcore. Get the job done and get a pretty, I was going to say maybe uneventful. It's not, you know, spectacular fireworks, first blood. But most importantly, goes on to Hardcore. Get your carry ahead and get the game into a good spot. Well, you would think, though, but it's about 1,000 gold despite the first blood bounty. Actually, it's still in favor. How much of, of that is Baskin? I want to see the, the net worth. So he's 51. Ooh, oh, oh, he saw at the bottom. Oh, it's 1,100. Oh it's just Baskin. Gore, it's just Baskin. It's only Baskin. Baskin is the lead. <laughs> and Variety's under tier two. Now, Charlie, I... You can't be safer. 
I say, mm, man. That's, that's the safest place to be. It's, you know, it's pretty darn safe. <laughs> Tier two at seven and a half. I say this phrase a lot. Um, unlucky? Was that what you're going for? I was going to say that's unfortunate. That's but, a good one, but, too. Yeah, unlucky for variety. I guess you could I don't call know. I don't know more to break down for that. Yeah, one. because think about it. This is a snowball effect of Baskin getting the... What? It was true luck. He was just channeling Percussive Storm through the wall. As we do see a bit of a scrap. Captain Twig taking some damage here. Good World time. Weaver on the way. Hits quick, though. This looks like a double down. I don't think this nets much. In fact, I think the Camelot Kings probably retreat here. But now, Captain Twig wants to go back in. He knows the dash comes through. Can you even kill Aurora, though? Well, they're going to try. River's Rebuke comes up. Aurora goes for the ult and barely makes it out of there, but makes it out nonetheless. Yeah, I had less than 100 health. Calculated. Honestly, less than 50 <laughs> by the time he actually made it out of there. Like you said, fully calculated. Never, never stressed it. Yeah, so unlucky for Baskin to get the first blue buff. That much is true. But Variety getting poked out, and then I believe lazy backing. Call it a lazy back, but at eight minutes underneath your tier two, surely you're feeling pretty safe there. You don't have beads, I know, able to find the kill. And now this man's proxying? Yeah. This is not unlucky. I'm this is this is Variety did it to himself for sure. Lil, maybe Lil Goofy goes for the Ox Worm, so now they know the bird's not gonna be there. You've got three collapsing in on you, knock up damage. And then before the summer salt cloud can come out, Baskin gets the last auto, and that's a second death for Variety and a second kill on the board for the Ferryman. A little bit of a poke trade out in mid, but nothing too crazy in Trelly. Blink and you miss it, 1,500 gold. At the rate they're going, we might be approaching 2,000. Yeah, a lot quicker. <laughs> 18, 1,900. All they need is one more neutral objective, a neutral camp in their favor. And the Ferrymen have a very commanding lead for the first 10. Okay, if I'm the Camelot Kings, I am making the executive sweeping declaration that the right side of the map is off limits. If I'm Captain Twig, I am sitting at every purple buff. That is the only play you can make. Fighting through the Wukong, is, you're dead in the water. It's not going to happen. Fighting, I mean, diving neat seems pretty probable, right? Or at the very least, taking this purple. If you send three over... Baskin. Doesn't seem like he's in too much trouble, if anything. Has good damage here to try and turn back. Paul on the way. Captain Twig should be dead off a dash like that. Well, he goes forward, and yeah, he's got so many surrounding Oh my god, the damage from Sino. It's more than I would expect, and it's just enough to get the job done. Variety goes in. A little bit of damage from Baskin. Taunt. Bird form taunt good, and that's going to be enough to lock him down. The Ferryman, four to one, read the kills. And they find two more clean pickups on the right-hand side of the map, Charlie. I, I'm going to say it one more time. Yeah, put some caution tape up. Do not enter. Do not go to the right <laughs> side of the map. Fighting with variety. It's, there's no reason. Baskin, I, I could tell you before that fight started, he wasn't going to die. Sure, it was closer than I thought, but still, that dash in from Twig was a death sentence. Cyclo needs to be your call. There is no reason that Baskin should die. It, it's just not going to happen. I think... The confidence lies from bringing Big Man Tings over. There's no magical defense yet from this Ryzen. So you see Tiamat, you see Book of Thoth, you see Spear of Desolation, you see big damage, which is true. Tings could have done big damage if he could close that gap. But because Paul's there, that goes dead in the water. Once again, Aurora has to try and ult out. Seems like he's got it. Won't be too big of an issue. That Defender of Olympus has been coming in clutch. Yeah, just a uh, get out of jail free card. That's just cost him about 90% of his health every single time. But he's been able to get out. They got purple, though. Purple buff invade. Successful. I, I need <laughs> you to were make holding, sure. You were holding your breath. <laughs> Sometimes you never know. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sino's going for a little more. Speed buff invade from the Ama. And successful at that. Despite the fact that you get some Tiamat presence. Oh, he's getting ganked again, for sure. He's got so many tier ones that have fallen down. <laughs> A variety, we know three minutes ago you can't feel safe under the tier two. Has to play it safe here. Cyclone, finally, someone goes on him. And finally, they're able to get the kill. There's no help from anybody else on the ferryman. And Trelly, they shut down early this time the Neath. I think if that decision was made five minutes ago, the Camelot Kings are in a much better spot. To just wait for Cyclone, eventually he has to walk up to a wave or to a purple buff. His beads are now down. Captain Twig needs to be ready to try and kill Cyclone Spin again. I mean, that, that is that is the start of the way back into this game for the Camelot Kings. 
because the right side of the map, like I said, dead in the water, no reason to be over there. Baskin is making the rotation over now. Oh my god. Now there's level 14 Ryzen, and I think Big Man Tinks is going to be in some big trouble. Here comes the Tycho Drums. Yeah, and with that taunt, man, the damage is there. It's just an argument for who gets the last hit in Baskin. Now to gold. The one to find it with the Tycho Drums. Three level lead for Sino. What was, we'll call it two and a half levels for Baskin. He was 14 to 11. Variety takes over to 12 during the fight. Gold Fury pulled. Gold Fury got Ferryman pulling ahead early here in game three. 5,000 gold, 12 minutes in. Yep, scary stuff. And because Cyclone got some free gold in pocket, he doesn't have to worry about his beads being down. No one is going to be nearby. And the sticks here, we get to set up for Pyromancer, which is going to be spawning in here shortly. Uh, the, the, the issue becomes where Big Man Tings, he's the vision, right? He's the guy that says, hey, we can go for Pyro, or hey, they're nearby. Does he want to be even close to Pyromancer? Not when his Tier 1 tower's gone. You can't even step up towards it. I mean, Cyclone Spin still has to be careful, and I like the fact that he is being vigilant. There is a ward behind his tower, just to show if he steps up. 60 uh -oh. seconds without beads. If Cyclone doesn't spot out Captain Twig here, he's almost certainly going to die, but Sino to the rescue. He weaves off this gank immediately, and he's going to try and defend the purple buff as well. Here comes Paul and Aurora. If anything, they might go in. Yeah, World Weaver on the hardcore. There's going to be the Dazzling Offensive looking for some stuns. You've got Aurora now coming down. Taunt onto two. It's Twig and hardcore pulled in, and the damage is there. It's coming from the Morgan the Fae. It's coming from the Neath, and they've got two clean kills from the Ferryman. They might be able to find a little more. Paul looks for some damage. Variety's rotated in. Knockup's going to be good. They might end up having to pay a little bit more, but the taunt still solid from Aurora to keep things going. Tings taking down. Variety left to the Hounds. Oxworm is going to get him out of there. Hardcore has to run away. Sino is not done with the chase. Neither Baskin's is here. Baskin. And you've got the damage. It's just about the slow burn, and they found it. Double for Paul. And oh man, how out of hand this game has gotten for the Kings. And Gore, I I said, you know, start looking towards left, give up on right. Now that would have been a correct call, but I think at this point, even if you did, Baskin was going to be a problem, right? Even if Cyclone Spin is 0-4 right now, you still have a level 16 Ryzen that is running amok around the map. Not even worried about magical defense going into the Typhons early on. Pyromancer is up. Guess what? Baskin's already there. Heading towards it immediately. Not sure if it's going to be a pull, but at the very least, vision towards it. The Camelot Kings have a very tall hill to climb. And their guide is, is Yarkor. That's their best option. 2-0. Level 15. Has a lead over Cyclone. A traditional auto attack hunter. So trying to deal with some of what Baskin's been able to do. Could be the call. Going for the Pyro answer here. I, I wouldn't hate the 50-50. I think they just stick on it, but they have to run because World Reaver's coming in for Captain Twig. And you got to worry about it. Takes it there for Tings. The shot's good. Leap over the wall. And now I guess you can't really afford the 50-50. Can you step back up? Pyromancer brought up by the Ferryman. And Charlie, there is not a king in sight. Runic Bomb goes to Sino. Gold in the pockets for the ferryman and lining them. I mean, you know, we talk about it. Last game, we got to the point where gold almost didn't matter because everybody's full build. This time, you've got breastplates, shoguns, all sorts of defense, a typhon's fang, whatever you want to call it, over what the kings have been able to build. Power spikes on power spikes. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to try and fight back in. I mean, the Camelot kings are doing as much as they can. Backflip in for Cyclone. Here comes the taunt from Aurora. Captain Twig already beads uh -oh. the bit of go. You got World Weaver if you want to try and catch out the Ming form, but not sure it's going to be necessary. Paul should be able to clean that one up. And you know what? He didn't even get the heal. He just wanted a shield buff, like man. He, yeah, he didn't even get his heal. Like, he, he taunted. It was about to tick. I don't think it makes a difference, but, you know, he didn't get it. World Weaver now on the team. No oh, Aegis. No! And that's going to be the chase down. All you need. And I'm having deja vu to game one. 11 to 2. And nothing short of a commanding lead for the Ferryman. They're going to go for the beacon here in a, about a minute. Maybe a little less when it spawns in. Charlie, I don't know if the Kings can even think about stepping up to it. They might think about it, but they probably shouldn't. <laughs> Yarkor is the only one nearby. Camelot Kings looking towards the right side of the map. Definitely the correct call. Try and find farm elsewhere, but Baskin 
is making sure that no nothing sneaky is going on, I suppose. No way Fire Giant was even under threat, but yeah. when you don't have vision on Yarkor, you gotta make sure, at the very least. We're in that kind of position, though, Gore, where the Camelot Kings... They need a Hail Mary. They need a Hail Mary. They, they need to group up at a speed buff. They need to sneak a Fire Giant. They need to five-man sit at Cyclones Purple. Those are the kind of low-stakes plays that need to come through. Almost certainly going to force a Somersault Cloud here. And Baskin does it for fun. Like, like, why not at this point? Are you under any threat? Is Ryzen's HP ever going to drop below half? Find out next oh, time. Man. And guess what? Sino was waiting. And Captain Twig's not even going to cancel his back. He was right there. And he said, good luck, bro. I'm going back to fans. <laughs> when your jungler is just sitting around the wall watching you die and goes... If I, I don't want to deal with that, man. If I stop my back, then they're going to beat me up. Yeah, and this just is just going to be a double kill. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to mess with that as much as possible. Poor Variety. And maybe poor Twig, who comes back in taunted, luckily. Turtle form gives him some shielding. Trelly. Man, I, it, I'm going to be honest. A far cry from the 50-minute game we had if a I'm Yark, I'm taking this. Low stakes play. You either get a solo kill or you get five-man ganked. Why not? And admittedly, considering what the rest of your team's been dealing with. Five-man gank is not even the worst-case scenario <laughs> for you. No objectives to really go for. I mean, maybe... Do you think... Could the, the ferryman, without a standard auto-attacker... They do have the Ama. Does the Ama make up enough that they could go for, like, an early fire giant? Oh, for sure. Uh, they, they definitely have the damage to do so. It's just... I think they're more so playing with their food. Uh, that's the truth of it all. They, they, could, they could go for fire right now. The issue is... Oh, they're going to 1v1. Cyclone is actually going for it with the Yarkor over in left lane. But no, it's never a 1v1. Not when Aurora is here. Unfortunate for Yark. Cannot find it. The defender of Olympus, Twig, also oh, falls down. Yeah, I'm going to Fire Giant <laughs> to answer your question. I'm I'm already there if I'm the Sticks Ferryman. But it's a low stakes game where three shutdowns would not be enough. And they, you would need probably four. Because you got Baskin, Sino, Paul, and Cyclone Spin who all have... At least a little bit of a bounty on their heads. And you're going to need them all. Trelly. A lot of defending that the Kings need to make to keep things going. 10,000 gold, 19 and a half minutes in, and 14,000 experience. 14,000 actual human experience as well. Variety, four levels down just now. Level 20 for Baskin. And I don't know what Variety is doing, but I see him deep in the right side jungle. All it takes is the wrong person seeing him. Luckily, Sino goes back to base. Roar might be in a little bit of trouble. No ult to his name. Pin off the mark. This is going to take a while. No taunt. World Weaver as well to get the it. CC. So even if they tried to commit, I'm not going to find too much. Two levels up, by the way, not only over his opposition, but over Twig for a roar. Let's go ahead and call that three, because he just ticked over to 17. Just great play right now from the Ferryman. A lot of catch-up to do. And I'm still kind of holding my breath for that Fire Giant. Well, hold you your think? breath no longer, Gore, because Cyclone Spin is on the right side of the map for the first time this game. And it's not for sightseeing. That Fire Giant will be done in the next 30 seconds. Question is, do Captain Twig and Big Man Tanks make a defense? Probably not. Can Aurora... Go over and left and defend? I don't think so either. That tier 2 should be dropping at the very least. So the Camelot King's going to get some extra gold in pocket. No, Roar's going to try. Wow. I, I, I said, can he make it? The answer was no. He's still going to attempt to. Goes over the left side of the map anyways. 21 minute FG going the way of the Ferryman. It's slow but steady. They are going to be able to push up. Oni Fury's up. And hey, the Camelot Kings. That's something they could go for. Oh, poor variety. <laughs> can he get up? He can. Can they even kill him here is the question. Silence out the bird form doesn't need to. And now your core forced ult away. Baskin is caught underneath the tower. There's some good damage coming his way, but his health bar's not dropping as much as you think. That river's rebuke keeps him in control. Damage on the Tings is more than enough. On to Quig, double for Cyclone. And he's 5-1-6. and six. Well, Take it wherever you want. 5-0-7, oh, 5-0-10, 3-0-8. Oh, and maybe march it in for a sub 25 minute game. The Ferryman on the Titan as they speak two to defend. And that's all the Kings have. Twig tries his best. Spread some damage out there. The tank Titan's gonna be tanky. 
Variety oh, and unfortunately five. for Twig, that's not going to happen. Can you save it enough for Variety? Hardcore is going to go back to the fountain. Variety shows up. Maybe low health bar is enough. And that forces the Ferryman to fall back everything just short of the Titan here in their favor. Almost the end call. And Variety, remember, does have Blink, does have Ult. Oh, I don't know if he's going to... His diamond is up. He, he could ult, but he's going to bring the team north. He's going to bring them away from the squad. Didn't end up using the ult. Didn't, Didn't want to. Didn't have the opportunity. <laughs> Did not want to. Todd comes through. There's the ultimate. Maybe the first end call was a little much. If this Phoenix fight goes well up, we might see the second end call from the six Ferryman and one Fire Giant push. Well, you've got four to deal with. Two of them are over and right, so the Phoenix should be pretty easy. You got the numbers advantage, chase down on the twig, ignore the Phoenix, go for the kill, and they do exactly that. Ferryman with two off the board, maybe looking for three, putting up one more kill on the hardcore. Baskin goes in, unable to lock it down, forces the ult. Hardcore makes it back to the fountain. Two birds down on the side of the Kings. Tier two is up on the left. They're thinking about it. They've got There's the bracer. Five seconds before variety is back. So if you're gonna burn, you gotta burn now. Minions coming in. And they're going to go for it. Goose eggs for three of the players on the Ferryman. And the Titan is the goal. Hardcore taken down instantly. Titan, half health, gets reset, goes back up to 3-4. Sino, low. And you had mentioned it. You need a few bounties. Well, they're not going to find them here. But you got fire minions pouring down right and mid. And it's just a small refactory period for the Ferryman before they decide to jump back in. The war is here. Doesn't go for the taunt on the variety. You're fighting a 4v5. Hardcore is back in 20. Titan taking damage. And it looks like this one might just be the charm. Sino's getting low, but will he go down? The answer is no. And the Ferryman in a 3-0 and out take care of the Kings today. Off the back of one of the best games we've had all year. I mean, that game two, 50 minute, back and forth, absolute banger. Game number three, anything but. The Sticks Ferryman could do no wrong. The second Baskin gets that lead, they say, hey, I know where we're fighting, on the right side of the map if there's a Ryzen, and that Ryzen got to Rome. Baskin went around, collected every every kill he wanted, gave some over to Sino. I mean, like I said, three bounties. There were three targets that needed to die, and those targets never did die. And Sino, I, I mean, you had kind of mentioned it. There was a point where you were saying, you know what, if I'm the Kings, give up on right. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sino decided to just take the fight to him wherever he could find them. Yeah. Uh, when Baskin had that lead, it made it easier for the two of them to roam, and then Paul was just doing Paul things. And after a while, even the, the Neath that we were like, okay, yeah, go bully the Neath. Like, if you're going to bully somebody, that's who you bully in this comp. Even she was finding the kills and turning things around, just unable to find their way in, not able to get any purchase this game. It's a 3-0 victory for the Ferryman, and that's going to do it for myself and Shelly. We'll throw it back to the desk, and they can break this down. Six Ferryman with the clean sweep up against the Camelot Kings. And Charlie made, I mean, it's after a barn burner of a game number two. The Kings fight back. They they do what they can. They push us super long. They fight very well in that game number two. And then game number three, they they just say, we're done with losing. We're we're just gonna we're just gonna win this one. Yeah, and it was from basically the spawn in point, it was all ferrymen the entire time. And when you fall behind against an Athena, you can't just make plays around the map because as soon as you, you try to make a play somewhere, Athena's there also. And then you try to do it on the other side of the map, the right side, uh, Athena and Neath Alt are there. 22 to two, two kills versus 22 kills. It, 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 it was not a very close game at all and it was, it was all ferrymen. Yeah, and maybe uh, maybe a bit of a solo jungle diff uh, is is you know, just just a little bit just a little, a little bit, bit. Uh, that from variety is is not what you're looking for. The they choose to to pick the warrior. He, he goes to Sun Wukong. Me and you were a little bit you know mystified by the Sun Wukong pick third there in the draft. Thought they might have gone for the Ama, might have gone for a, a safer guardian. Might, but he goes for the the Sun Wukong and he tries to proxy it at seven minutes and and loses his life and and finds himself four levels down at one point and the Styx Ferryman they're just able to play so well through this Raijin and it just it just looks like they don't have a weakness and, and you see what they could have had in that Amaterasu how much Sino actually did on that a little of a unexpected pick for sure but I mean Sino piloted it very well as you said solo jungle side of the map 
was fully in favor of the ferryman. The king opted to fight over there uh, a couple times and, and would just outright lose. I mean, Yarkor 2-2, outside of that, 0-2, 0-5, 0-6, 0-7 for the kings. A and then you look at the ferryman side, Baskin undying, Sino undying, Paul undying. Two deaths, both in duo lane. It doesn't matter. That's not the side that the ferryman wanted to play through. They wanted to play through solo, and it was them the entire time. And I'm looking at those damage numbers. You get 7k from Twig compared to the 17 from Sino, and, and that's all. And that is a that is almost a 20,000 damage difference between what Baskin was able to put out and what yeah. Variety was able to put out. 0 and 6 and 0 and 7, respectively, for the King's solo jungle dive. Yeah, I mean, it just it just feels like the Ferryman got to play exactly how they drew it up. They picked the Mage solo for pressure. That's what we've seen all, all, all the time. Sino picks an aggressive warrior that gives them a little bit more purchase on the map, and they just they, they get it done. It feels like they, there was nothing to stop them. And, and Trelly mentioned, you heard him on the cast, you, you had to find picks onto them. You, you had to, like, just focus them out, get them to fall at least once. You get a shutdown kill. They just never could. That, I mean, it's really hard to do it into the Athena, and that's what makes the Athena so good from ahead. Free dash taunt, or you just get the ult to wherever you're trying to look to fight. Great comp by the Ferryman, and, and they play it near flawlessly. Play it near flawlessly for that last one. We can hear even more about it with an interview Baskin standing by. That's right, I got Baskin here, and I'm going to ask you about game three first, just because it's the last one that happened. When was it for you guys that you kind of knew the game was like, under wraps that you had the, the control that you did? Um, uh, I don't know the exact minute mark, but uh, Sino killed a variety under T2, um, and then he got away because he shelled. So around that point, I was kind of thinking, like, yeah, this game's going to snowball pretty hard. And we got to see, you know, one of, I would argue, the best games that we've gotten to see, especially going 50 minutes. Normally, Fire Giant fights, Fire Giant dances. They're, they're slow, methodical. But in game two, you guys are fighting with the Kings, always going three for three. What was the, the team comms like? What was the mentality like as that the, the minute mark kept going, you know, past 35, past 40, past 45? Um, I think that was actually the most fun uh, game of the split for us. Uh, it was pretty much just 30 minutes of straight team fighting. It was really uh, competitive. And I feel like that's where the Kings do their best work is in team fights. I feel like they're struggling early game. Um, but when they get to team fights, they're always really solid. And that's what they were known for uh, last, uh, last season as well when they won Worlds. So it was, yeah, that was a really fun game. Um, yeah, uh, as far as the mentality goes, it was just like, it was definitely like really uh, high energy today. So I think our comms were really good around around uh, the objectives. Um, yeah, that was a fun game. And spectacle, I think, is the, the way I would describe your set and your play style. Right now, though, not only a 3-0 win, but but you've been top of your division. We're, we're getting to the point where, you know, in the next couple of weeks, maybe one to two matchups for a lot of the teams that are left. But then you're looking towards playoffs, looking towards Worlds. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, long view, what's the, the ferryman's mentality at? Where were your eyes set? I mean, eyes definitely set on Worlds. I think that's pretty much every team. Um, obviously, it's nice to do well in the regular season. It sets, sets us up for a Worlds run. But yeah, definitely the end goal is Worlds. Um, yeah, end goal is Worlds like every other team, pretty much. Yeah. End goal is Worlds. And they're looking good trying to get there. Baskin, congratulations on the 3-0. Thanks for your time. We'll go back to the desk. We hear Baskin there pretty confident, especially in that, that team fighting game number two. Energy is high. The comms are high. They like to try and, you know, work through that stuff. But with that win, Sticks Ferryman, they take – I mean, we can take a look at the schedule for the rest of the weekend. But with that 3-0, they take a guaranteed top seed in their division. So it now cannot be caught up by the Leviathans, I believe. They are top in that division, and with that – fall from the Kings. I mean, they would have to see a loss from the from the Ravens if they wanted to catch up and try and grab that second seed in their division as well. So definitely an impactful matchup. Uh, and you can see where the standings round out, of course. But that loss from the Kings, I mean, that, that's going to hurt them a little bit. Yeah, the Kings needed this one today. They unfortunately don't get it. Other side, Ferryman looking great. Like, this has been now the entire phase great play by the ferryman and you heard baskin like now they're trying to ramp up towards world this phase is coming to a close they have one set left that last set is, is is basically the lead up to now the actual playoffs and then that's lead up to world so this is now wrapping up putting kind of a bow on this second phase and you want to be coming out of this phase hot that, that that's the entire point of phase is to make it really far into the playoffs to make it farther in world so you need to start heating up now no you're absolutely right now is the time to start heating up. You only have a couple weeks left. You got playoffs, you got the road to worlds. We are leading 
towards the penultimate of Season X. We got another great matchup coming around the corner, though. This is going to be the Jade Dragons versus the Oni Warriors. Where, where are you thinking this one? The Warriors have looked fantastic. I can't shy away from them, but the Dragons have also looked really, really good. I'm going to say slight advantage Warriors. Warriors have been great all season. The Jade Dragons looking renewed with Vaporish Coast. We'll throw it to a quick break and then be back with that matchup.